So welcome everybody to Conversations in Conservation Part 2 by Buckets of Love, which is my baby and I'm so excited to tell you more about Buckets of Love today. Lots of you already come and support Buckets of Love events. Loads of you make donations with your time, with your talent, with your cooking, um, and more importantly, with cleaning up after my events. So I'm so grateful um, to everybody who's supported Buckets of Love. Um, and I'm so grateful to you all for coming today uh, because I know it's early, I know it's a Saturday and I know you're all so busy. So I'm really, really grateful. I will be recording it, but do try and stay for as long as possible to support all of the speakers. We've got some amazing international speakers speaking today. So some of the talks that we'll be having today are from Ecomedics, The Retreat Animal Sanctuary, Daughters of the Deep, Birchfields Highlands, Dr. Ishani Rao, so that's me, and I'll tell you more about myself this morning. Second Nature Films, Sadhana Forest, and the Sussex Seabed Restoration Project. So all of the donations from this charity conference are going towards our third well for clean water for a village in India. So I've just messaged the charity Drop for Drop that do amazing work, and for each well, they take 2,500 pounds, and then they build a well for a village which didn't have access to clean water before. Uh, and so we've got two wells as of yet. And I've just sent them an email to say that we'll be ready to donate the third one soon. And that's with a combination of a couple of buckets of love events, lots of generous donations, my dad's 60th birthday fund and his friends are being so generous. And also from this conference. So I'm really, really grateful for any support but please don't feel like you need to donate. I just want to be sharing the message about these amazing projects. So what's our schedule for this morning? So a little bit, little bit of a late start, it's about five past 10 now. So I'm gonna do a little bit of a chat about the speakers today and about buckets of love. This is the schedule. Uh, I think it's up on the Facebook. So we're gonna do about half an hour sessions. But the updates, two updates from the speakers from last year, we'll be doing about 15 minute sessions and just chatting to us about what they've been up to since we chatted to them last year. So Second Nature Films. I met Kate and Mick at their screening of Eating Plants, which was a free screening and it was in London and it was a few years ago. And I completely fell in love with the docuseries. I've always been quite triggered by things like MasterChef or cooking shows because they're quite meat heavy. And as a vegan, I, I, I don't enjoy watching it. And I know lots of my friends and family feel the same. And this is the first docuseries that I've ever seen that's so colorful and vibrant and fun and covers loads of cooking sessions as well. They've also got some amazing documentaries, including one about kangaroos, which I'll tell you about, and one about whales as well. So... Second Nature Films is an independent film production company created to celebrate and raise awareness about our natural environment and to celebrate the lives of people with whom we share this planet. So I can't wait to hear from Kate and Mick today. Uh, we did a screening for of Eating Plants recently, which fundraised about uh, £900 for Buckets of Love. So I'm super grateful to them for their work as well. Now, Sadna Forest. Sadhana Forest is an international volunteer-based not-for-profit organization that aims to teach local citizens and volunteers about environmental renewable and sustainable living. In 2003, Yorit and Avram Rosen started Sadhana Forest in Auroville in India. The project also targets reforestation and water conservation in other rural locations, including Kenya and Haiti. And I think they're currently working on a Sadhana Forest somewhere else. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to disclose that, but we'll see what they say. Um, Sadhana Forest works as a long-term sustainable development project. Now we fundraised, uh, our first screening fundraised about 900 pounds for Sadhana Forest. And also we've got a group of about six of us going out to Sadhana Forest in a couple of weeks for their second vegan forest festival. So I'll be hosting a workshop there about activist mental health, and I'm so excited to go and support their amazing project. So can't wait to hear from Luke today, hear about what he's been doing. I think he's been living there for about five, six years now, so we'll catch up with him soon. Batchfield Highlands. So this is a forest rewilding project and natural capital laboratory in the Scottish Highlands. 
I think it covers about 100 acres and this is them teaching people about how to rewild the Scottish Highlands. So actually conservation projects can be right on your doorstep and you don't have to travel super far for them. So this is really exciting because this is really accessible and super beautiful. As well as be, being a rewilder, Amelia Lees, who's gonna be presenting this today, is an author. Her first book, Think Like a Vegan, is about vegan ethics. And she's also a lawyer, so who better to discuss vegan ethics? As well as this, she's a magazine editor and podcast host, so I can't wait to hear from Amelia today. Ecomedics. So unfortunately, the founder of, ne of Ecomedics, Dr. Nathan Hudson Peacock, he couldn't be here today because of a family emergency. So I was really panicking because I was looking for somebody to present about Ecomedics. And I was asking all of the team and it was such late notice. And then I realized, well, I'm on the Ecomedics team uh, and I was really proud to be asked to be on the Ecomedics team. And, and we've got a lot of fun things planned. They're doing absolutely incredible work. So I will be chatting to you about Ecomedics today. The Sussex Seabed Restoration Project. So last year's co conference donated over 400 pounds to the Sussex Seabed Restoration Project a pioneering project to restore a vast underwater kelp forest off the Sussex coast. Steve Ornat set up a small Facebook group, which now has thousands of followers. I think it's about 6,000 people who are really engaged with the project. He's being featured regularly in the media, so he's going to tell us a little bit about that today. And he's still working as an NHS physiotherapist and is now teaching medical students too. And I think he's having a lot of fun with that. And I'm sorry about us. Uh, Steve is an amazing force of nature, and we can't wait to hear about his progress with the Kelp Restoration Project. The Retreat Animal Rescue. Now, I haven't heard from Billy today, um, so I'm hoping that Billy is still scheduled for today. I'll tell you a little bit about it anyway, because it's such a good project to support. The Retreat Animal Rescue Centre offers much needed support to all animals, farmed, domestic and wild. Their aims are to educate the public that all animals need commitment, love and respect. Also, animals should be neutered to avoid more unwanted litters. By rehoming animals, they can provide much needed space to rescue more abused animals. All of the animals are given the time, vet care and love that they need to recover before being homed. So the retreat is an absolutely amazing sanctuary. Um, they have regular volunteering days. Uh, they have a little charity shop inside and they also have a summer festival. Um, so I think probably Rebecca is the best person to, for us to speak to about that. Uh, we still don't have the details finalized. I'm hoping Billy can speak today, but if not, then we'll fill in the gaps with some other amazing projects. Daughters of the Deep, I'm so excited to hear from George Bevan about Daughters of the Deep. Daughters of the Deep is an international charity and community of passionate individuals rising up against the socioeconomic barriers that restrict access to the education and practical experiences needed for women to enter marine careers. Their mission is to give young women who have a passion for the ocean, the confidence and the opportunity to dry scuba diving, to master the sciences, to captain ships, and become the lead voices in the fight to save our seas. Every time they hit the water, Daughters of the Deep want them to feel empowered to achieve what they want to out of life. So this is an amazing, amazing mission. And we're gonna be hearing from George Bevan, who's a conservation scuba diver instructor. And he also operates two marine conservation programs. This is taken from the Daughters of the Deep website from the section about George. George firmly believes that gender inequality is an issue for both sexes, and so he and other men need to take action to repair the imbalance. So from fellow conservation scuba divers, especially females, thank you so much for what you're doing. We can't wait to hear from Daughters of the Deep today. I'll be doing a session as well about my favourite topic, which is activist mental health, to try and help us figure out ways that we can prevent burnout in people that might be advocating for animals or other communities or for the environment. So I think this is really important because I really want us to be having fun while we do good things. I think it's really important that we enjoy what we're doing and that we recognize if we need to take a break or if we're going to burn out so that we can continue to be effective activists and to support the people and the, the causes that need it. So I'll be talking today about activist mental health. But before that, let's get started with Buckets of Love. So Buckets of Love, how it started. 
Buckets of Love started with us giving out hot chocolate to the homeless community in London when I was a university student. So we used to go out with an organization called Hot Choc Sock, which is absolutely fantastic. I don't know if it still exists, but it used to be at King's College London. And we used to take out hot chocolate to the homeless. But this was problematic for two reasons. One, they didn't like my vegan hot chocolate. Actually, one homeless person spat it out and said, that's disgusting. Um, and also, I thought, actually, we could be bringing out a lot more things um, with the time and with the efforts that we're making. So now we collect a lot of things and give them out to the homeless. So that's kind of how it started. But then what really solid, what's, what solidified it was when I went on holiday with my family, probably six or seven years ago now, we went to India. So we are all Indian and we went with the best intentions um, to take out water and scarves and donations to the homeless community of Delhi. Now, this was a very different experience uh, to taking out presents to the homeless community in London. And it really, really made us think about how we could be effective activists and support marginalized communities while still having fun. So this is how Buckets of Love started. It started with a bus journey with my family in India, trying to figure out what we could do with all of this time and love. So that's how it started, but how it's going is that we've donated 18,000 pounds so far to various charities. So these have included refugee charities, children's mental health charities, the two wells, which is now coming up to the three wells, Sadna Forest, Sussex Seabed Restoration Project, One Happy Family, which is a community center for refugees in Lesbos. Um, yeah, and a few different, and a few other things over the years, which have been super, super fun to do. We always have a great time doing it. It brings people together um, and it really, really emphasizes the importance of um, bringing people together for, for good causes. So this is an amazing photo of our second well, which was opened just last summer through our fourth annual drama based fundraiser. So that's the size of the well, uh, which covers water for a thousand people in India. So that's really exciting and I can't wait to donate the third. And actually in two weeks, I'm, I happen to be flying to Chennai to go and visit Sadhana Forest and the two wells happen to be about an hour and a half from Chennai. So I'm going to go up and I'm going to see the two wells and I've spoken to Drop for Drop so they're going to help me organise this and we're actually going to be able to see these in person, see how they're functioning and to just make sure that it would be worth continuing to support this amazing project. So yeah, we had loads of photos and videos from the opening ceremonies. So this is really, really exciting. And I feel like it's a really effective way. Um, we've got really lovely letters from the people that are benefiting from this, saying that the children don't have to walk six, seven, eight kilometers now before school in the morning. They can just go straight to the well and it saves them a lot of time uh, that they could be spending doing other things. So we've so far wrapped up about 150 presents for the homeless. So this is really, really great. Uh, we have loads of fun doing it. It's always a really special day. And it's always just, you know, vegan snacks and donations of scarves and gloves and warm things for the homeless. And, and we always have a really special day wrapping them up around Christmas time. We do litter picking walks as well. So this is one that we did at the RSPB Nature Reserve. We collected about 10 bin bags full of rubbish. And it was a beautiful day as well. It was really, really cold in the winter, but it was really nice for us to get out. And you can tell that we were all really happy at the end of this. We all went for a meal afterwards and it just felt like such a nice way to be spending a beautiful afternoon. So my favorite thing is dancing. So I love to dance with my friends. And this is a photo of my wonderful friends, Vanessa, so Ghost Hardware, and Kai as well. Uh, so these two amazing DJs have donated their time and talent over the last few years. And we are now coming up to our fifth annual drum and bass fundraiser. So I'm hoping to have a few events later on in this year, um, a variety show, a music event, uh, and we're going to be having our fifth annual drama-based fundraiser coming up, which is really exciting. We also do Vegan Activist Mental Health Days. So this is one really special day where we had my lovely friend and Peter activist Molly Elston 
doing her yoga session. We also had my lovely friend Luciana hosting some music therapy and also massage therapies. Um, my wonderful brother Sachin, um, he hosted a personal training session. And then we had some wonderful sharing circles as well. So we have some really, really great mental health days to look after activists, specifically from the vegan community, because that's my community. And my heart um, completely goes out to these people that are dedicating their time looking after the voiceless. So I think it's really important that we look after each other as well. So we have amazing mental health days. This is another one of Mo Molly's sessions. So she's so kind. She always donates her time and her talent to looking after us. So this is Molly Elston's yoga. So I would definitely look out, look into that and support her. This was the sold out film screening of Eating Plants TV. So we're going to be hearing from the, the producers of that in about 10 minutes. Uh, but this was our second screening. And I am now a... a annual member to the cinema and it's such a brilliant cinema it's the world cinema in Brixton world spent like the past participle of well not world the planet um but yeah so these screenings are absolutely amazing we have loads and loads of food we have q and a's with activists as well um so definitely check these out because we're going to be having a few more of these uh, later in the year and yeah, so with Buckets of Love, if you've got any ideas that you want to organize, you know, a charity event, or you've been thinking about doing something, then please just send us a message. Uh, I'm always more than happy to help and to figure out the logistics of things. I've got loads of venues um, which we're associated with, so I can always uh, make some suggestions. I also am very good at cooking very quickly for 40 or 50 people now. Um, so if you do want, if you want me to get involved with cooking, you know, healthy plant-based foods, then definitely just let me know. Um, and always just come and support our events. The crowds are always amazing. Our friends and families always get involved. It's such a good community effort. Um, so definitely just reach out and come to our upcoming events later this year. So this is our website, which is designed again by my uh, multi-talented brother. And um, so this is our website. So you can just check us out on bucketsoflove.co.uk or you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram as well. So what, what can we do to get involved with projects like Buckets of Love, which are involved um, with creating better community and to do with helping each other out and having loads of fun for really good causes. So we can share ideas. So this day is about networking, it's about sharing each other's contact details, it's about getting in touch with each other. We can donate and that doesn't just have to be money. That can be our time, that can be skills, that can be food, that can be any unwanted gifts or items that you've got. We always need help with organizing events. And definitely just spread the word. So just tell people about Buckets of Love, tell people about events, bring your friends, bring your family. Um, we really value it. It's, it's 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 a team project. So definitely just bring people when you see any of these events. And thank you for coming today. So thank you so much. Uh, these are my contact details. I'll be sharing all of these as well. You can find these on Buckets of Love. If you want to follow me on Instagram and reach out with anything, then just message me. And also, this is my link tree. Is Dr. Ishani Rao. So you can just message me on Linktree as well. It's got loads of my articles. It's got all of the Buckets of Love websites on there. So definitely just have a look at the Linktree because that's a nice way of putting everything together. Um, and then let's move on with the schedule today. So in a couple of minutes, we have Second Nature Films and we've got a recap on Sadden and Forest. We've got Amelia talking about Birchfields Highlands. We've got me talking about eco-medics. Uh, we've got Steve coming in to do a recap. It's only brief, I think, but uh, I would love to have him. Last year, I think Steve did about an hour and even that wasn't long enough. So this year we've only got Steve for 15 minutes and um, then hopefully we'll have Billy uh, for the retreat animal sanctuary. Then for any budding conservation scuba divers or anybody that wants to find out more about life under the ocean, then we've got George talking about Daughters of the Deep. Then I'll be wrapping it up with a quick session on how we can best look after our mental health. And then at 2 p.m. we will be ending. So like I said, this is completely, completely chilled. If you want to get up, go for a cup of coffee. If you want to get food, that's absolutely fine. If you guys want to chat to each other in the chat box, that's absolutely fine as well. Just share your project um, and enjoy the morning. Right, can everybody see me? 
let's see who I've got here. I've got Ali, lovely. I've got Sachin, morning. Uh, Sachin is my PR, my admin, my personal trainer, um, my therapist. So yeah, I've got uh, family members here as well. And I think I've got our next guests. Have I got Mick and Kate here? Let's give them a Hello, call. hello. Morning, hi. Hey, good Ella, evening. How are you? Good evening. Good evening, of course. I hope I'm not disturbing your Saturday night party time too much. <laughs> not too bad. Not too bad. <laughs> how are you? Very well, very well. Very good. Very uh, hot and humid tonight. Oh, lucky you. Look at this. It is uh, grey and humid. <laughs> I feel so lucky that you guys weren't able to make it to the screening just by coincidence recently. Yeah, it was really fun. It was so yeah. great to meet everyone. I agree. What an amazing little cinema. So great that you've joined up because... Uh... Well, it was great synergy because, yeah, you were putting it on and we happened to be in London that week. Mm. So how's that for synergy? <laughs> so lucky because the first time I, I saw you guys, I don't think we met. I think I asked you a question in the audience uh, and I fell in love with eating plants. I happened to just fall into your screening in London as well. So we just happened to keep meeting on the other, other sides of the world. So it's been really, really lovely. That's great. That's great. Well, that's the way, uh, I mean, and your enthusiasm is obviously, you know, ca catches lots of people's interest. So it's it's excellent that, you know, so many people came to the screening in um, at the World Cinema. And, yeah, uh, in October. It so it was fun. Halloween, wasn't it? Because like, I mean, I, to I told everybody to dress in fancy dress, but I think I was the only person in fancy dress. And I had pepperami, <laughs> vegan pepperami stuck to my head like Lady Gaga. And I smelt the whole day and nobody else was dressed up. And it was so funny. We had such a good time. So yeah, we have a great community here. So you're always most welcome. And I'm hoping to show some more of your amazing episodes later on in the year. Great, yeah, yeah. Well, we just... Um just finished season two all up and last it's, week in fact. and uh so it's being sent to the sales distribution uh agent and will be on tv screens in around the world you know as 2024 unfolds oh congratulations i know you it's a good so much fun with it <laughs> yeah no it's a, yeah. it is a good feeling to get it out it's like the birth of a you know a, a child you just sort of <laughs> hand it over um, yeah. And, uh... Well, I don't think I've ever told you both this, but my grandma, uh, she was one of the top caterers. She was the first Indian caterer that was making Indian ready meals uh, in about, must have been the 60s or 70s. And she's an amazing wow. cook. Uh, and she was doing it to like Waitrose and to supermarkets. But she's been vegetarian her whole life. And so mm. she found it really difficult watching things like MasterChef where she didn't really connect with it and she found it quite repulsive. And she said, you know, there's such a void for vegetarians and I'm trying to convince her to go vegan. And she's very, very close. Um, but she was also 81. And when I showed her, uh, you're eating plants, she was crying. You know, she oh, said, I didn't wow. know anything like this existed. She was so, oh, so wow. happy. So yeah, I don't think I've ever told you guys that, but you, you reached out to my grandma. Oh, that's fantastic. So, I mean, we really did want to show something different too. We also had the experience, me and my daughter really love uh, food shows and we would love watching cooking and watching the onions cook and the garlic. And then they would say, and then you chop up this animal and put them in the pan and we'd go, Turn off. Oh, no, we don't like that bit. So we found ourselves turning off all the time. And um, that was one of the instigations for really saying like oh let's really make something that vegans can watch let's make something that's tasty delicious like really satisfying for all palates but you know we also love that vegans get to watch it without having to sort of Turn look off. away from the television yeah so you've got that side of it where we all feel really calm and we know that we're not just sitting there in anxiety with a cooking show i maintain that i can't cook because i've never wanted to watch cooking shows and now i've got no excuse because you've got eating plants tv <laughs> But you've also got all of the non-vegans that really, really enjoyed it and actually sat there and said, oh, my God, this food looks amazing. So you're also really appealing to that side as well, which is incredible. Mm, mm. Yeah, well, that's our experience as well. People people are constantly saying, you know, they'll go to an event or something and they'll try vegan food and they'll say, oh, it was so tasty. 
but how can we possibly do that? So it was always that was also a, an inspiration for us to to make it as simple and basic as possible um, to allow people to learn how to to create you know vegan dishes. And as we all know, it's it is really simple. Yeah. Well, you've got mac and cheese sandwiches, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. do you guys want to get started with the presentation just telling us about what you've been up to and um about your work sure yeah well so uh for people who weren't uh at world cinema <laughs> uh one of the things we've been working on lately is this new vegan tv series called eating plants we've just done the second season so there's 12 episodes to watch it's filmed in 12 countries and you know, apart from wanting a good cooking show, we really um, had met some amazing uh, vegan entrepreneurs around the world who are, you know, f initially and first off, they're great people to meet, super fun and just really full, kind hearted folk. But also, they're really challenging the whole way of the food industry now. They're um, coming up with ideas and recipes and restaurants and uh, whole new products that were changing the way people uh, looked at food. And we really wanted to showcase that. So particularly non-vegans felt invited and uh, introduced to a vegan lifestyle. It was always our intention to make it mainstream. Um, we, uh, you know, our previous films have been investigative and, you know, have, have, quite a strong message but this one we you know this series we really wanted to make it mainstream and as Kate said that um that was intentional so people who like to watch these sort of shows can still watch it without feeling like they're being preached to um and and it we've succeeded because it's had some uh commercial tv sales so it was always our intention to make it like that um and uh yeah that was um that was quite challenging at times because we wanted to, you know, we wanted to make it, uh, you know, uh, we often had to pull things out. So it wasn't, you know, um, too sort of, um, uh, too sort of, what, what's the word, uh, you know, um, preachy or whatever. Um, so, yes, but as Kate said, it, uh, it's been an absolute privilege to meet the entrepreneurs in this, you know, vegan space. What, what, I mean, we did learn, didn't we, that it's the, fastest growing food trend in the world at the moment yeah so yeah that's a good that's a good reason to make it yeah, <laughs> yeah so we, we, kind, of, we yeah. kind of kind of knew that we were on on thread there to you know because in the documentary world um new is everything you know um old and tired is is death in the in the documentary world so yeah we kind of knew that we were onto something because this is such a a growing trend um, around the world. I think we were really grateful too to, you know, a lot of people that we've met along the way had watched What What the Health or Forks Over Knives or shows like that or um, Dominion or Earthlings and gone, oh, this is, I can't bear to watch this anymore. I don't want to be part of it. I don't know what to, you know, and they, although they're fantastic shows, they don't really guide you much into like how to do veganism like how to shop at the supermarket what <laughs> what products you want on your shelf or how to start what to have for breakfast lunch or dinner you know what to put in the school lunch box I don't know really kind of basic stuff that you know and having a few I, I don't know about you but I'm I well you're not much of a cook but you know <laughs> as, <laughs> as I well, really, that might change now yeah I really like cooking <laughs> yeah I really you like can find me up with an excuse uh, I think that, you know, you have like your sort of five good recipes that you bring on, especially if you've got kids. You and have stuff five? No, I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> so, you know, you have your things. And I think if, if, you know, three or five of them can be vegan, then you're sort of really starting a whole new trend in your family and in your diet. And like what you might take to a party suddenly becomes vegan or what you might have, cook at Christmas or what you might like, I don't know, the sort of, you kind of have to make it part of your personality that you're really good at cooking this particular dish that happens to be vegan. Yeah. And everyone goes, Oh, bring that dish, bring that dish. You always make it's great. You know? And, and I think that the show actually has a, um, at the end of every episode in 12 countries is like something we try to go pretty local, but go something that is 
cooked in that country that's not too hard so if, even if you're like a beginner you could really cook at home so we've given people 12 new recipes <laughs> so that and the recipes are on our website and just sort of so you can know what to cook and and we we're living by example because we use those recipes yeah all the so time our, our yeah. cooking <laughs> our cooking has improved incredibly isn't it like yeah. you know the the mac cheese recipe the lentil bolognese the what else like there you know the, as you say there's four I, I mean i know we're cooking most of them yeah, and yeah. we again step by step we put it up on the screen for people to follow and then they can follow up on the website so we re it really is a, a how to be plant-based tv show and and uh well, yeah it's it's... because uh, i actually link a lot of recipes to my patients and I never make it, I try and make it a bit subtle. So instead of linking, for example, veganuary um, or vegan recipes, I would do Bosch, for example, or something like that. So I try and keep it a little bit subtle, but still fun. So actually mm. I'll look for your recipes and I'll add that to my list because that was absolutely perfect. And my patients always, you know, they're coming in with high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, all of these really preventable things. And a lot of mm. them, want a pill and a lot of them say we don't want a pill what can we do about our lifestyle so actually mm. them seeing things like yours is so motivating and inspiring and it really breaks it down for people that want to change but don't know how so tell me yeah. about your backgrounds tell me about how all of these films started <laughs> yeah well we we um we started our production company a long time ago and the intention we came up with the intention of second nature films to produce documentaries that inspire us um because we figured that if they inspire us they're going to inspire the audience and then we narrowed it down even further to to be about in the environment and protecting the environment and instigating social change um so yeah that's where it started um and where did that interest come from the conservation <laughs> environmentalism social justice where did it come from i don't know are you born into it i'm not sure like we both met uh, funnily enough, I was working on outdoor theatre shows and I had been uh, celebrating the migratory wading birds that fly from New Zealand and Australia up to Russia every year. Do you year. have a film you know, about that now? Uh, no, I was doing a theatre show. like a, but there's a web show. An outdoor theatre show. And uh, at the time, um, I met Mick and he had just been in Japan uh, working for the whales and I had been in Japan looking at Ramsar and the migratory wading species. And we were, he was doing film and I was doing theatre and we were like, oh yeah, I really understand what you were doing there and, and how you're bringing art and environmentalism to, into the same space. And uh, that was like in the early 90s. And we both were really inspired by celebrating the environment and really kind of noticing and um, creating art and finding ways for people to really hone in on what's great about the environment so that they wanted to protect it basically. Yeah. And yeah. I guess that was a joint passion right from the start. And so for the last 20, 30 years, we've been making films and um, working for animals in the environment and, and people that are, and sort of celebrating also and highlighting people that are working for change. And um, it's been such a, I mean, it's always a joy uh to work i mean you know it's hard sometimes making films are hard work but the people that we meet along the way and they're telling their stories is a absolute privilege and you know the eating plants was no different and not only that uh we at the screenings we meet great people like you and and because people are attracted to finding out about that topic and and i think you know it's easy to get lost in the um in the world news and you know the the hard things that are happening and it's great to find a way to bring people's attention to the good things that are going on yeah in such a beautiful way because people really connect with films and like you said with things like dominion people can get really uh triggered by it, it makes people feel quite negative i think they're really powerful and they do have their place but at the same time what you guys are doing with creating such a positive and kind of motivational platform is such an incredible way of doing it so i can't ignore your t-shirt mick do you want to tell us about uh, your experiences and, and, and your care for the kangaroos? Yeah, well, Kangaroo, A Love Hate Story was our film before eating plants. And yeah, it's it's a it's a feature documentary 
It's a very uh, hardcore investigative piece. Um, it became a much bigger project than we ever dreamt because it's um, the treatment of kangaroos in Australia is a is a deep dark secret, um, and it is something that w it was it was ours to uncover. Um, despite you know talking about <laughs> the inspirational films that we've made we were compelled to make it for all sorts of reasons um and How yeah did you start it was finding very... out about their treatment How... yeah so it was a it was a very uh it's a shocking film it was a shocking film to make but a very important one um yeah, one way to describe it is the variety magazine compared it to the cove and blackfish which you know well, on the one hand is not the ultimate compliment but on the other hand it means that it, yeah, it, it was it is powerful and um, so basically, yeah, what started out as a, as a, a recognition and a celebration of this great icon, um, which we, you know, realised was an international icon. It's not just Australia's icon, it's an international icon. It was, you know, research shows that it's the third most recognisable icon in the world next to the Statue of Liberty and the Eiffel Tower. So we knew that it was, a, it was worthy of a feature documentary what we didn't realise was just how um, deep uh, the story goes in regard to Australia's long history of killing kangaroos and it's become a commercial industry killing wild kangaroos and shipping them off to America and Europe as meat and skins and that continues today. So it really, um, it really is an investigative piece that we're very proud of. It's really uh, instigated a movement to stop this commercial killing um and uh yeah we're really proud the film did uh was very successful it was considered for the 2019 academy awards so it was a you know it was a uh it was it it did more than we ever imagined by exposing the treatment and the brutal killing that's going on in australia and how does the publicity start initiating change how does that start to develop into legislation yeah, that's a good question. I just wanted to uh, just jump in before then that we worked with Juliet Galatly from Viva, who has been, and Viva has been one of the NGOs around the world that's been working on kangaroos for a long time. And she came across to Australia years ago and was fearless in her investigative journalism around um, and campaigning around the treatment of kangaroos. So, you know, we have quite a lot to thank for Viva and the pressure that Viva has made to keep kangaroo body parts out of the UK. Uh, the UK which has been a fantastic because uh, one of the worst parts for kangaroos is that they it's become a commercial trade. So not only are they being killed on the landscape, but they're being sold now, which always puts enormous pressure on wildlife. Yes. So um, one of the biggest um, importers of, Euro of kangaroo products is the European Union and countries in the in the European Union. And so we work quite a lot over there. I guess um, there's a number of ways that we work um, for the kangaroos now. Well, primarily when we finished the film, we were really hoping that some of the larger animal rights NGOs would take it up in Australia and really carry the ball because we felt the film had done its job and lots of people were responding to it, both, you know, calling us treacherous and also follow and just being completely surprised by the story. So, you know, both sides and, um, but none of the big NGOs actually picked it up uh, as a campaign at the time. It's very, very political in Australia. Probably like hunting is in England, fox hunting or something, you know, like mm. it's mm. deeply mm. embedded in culture. Mm. So to pull it out of the culture is, you know, a big job. Mm. Anyhow, um, we, were we were compelled to set up an NGO of our own called Kangaroos Alive. If people want to have a look at that, kangaroosalive.org. And we have spent the last four or five years um, campaigning, building up, you know, surveys, campaigning on the government level, speaking in parliamentary, handing in papers, just like talking to the public. We've got uh, World Kangaroo Days and it's fifth year in 2024 to really raise awareness for the kangaroo. So yeah, we've been... Um, not this is not nothing that we ever expected to be yeah. doing <laughs> but we were political activism we, come on yeah but we were compelled to as kate said and we're very uh, very um proud of it we we fundraised and we now have a campaigner who's fantastic so 
he's working on all of these things and you know um and yeah and we we have had some really big victories along the way we had nike stop the use of kangaroo skins last year in their in their wow. soccer boots we've had prada and versace and gucci stop using kangaroo skins we've had cutter for um supermarket in france and as kate said thank thank you to viva uk for uh, making sure that kangaroo meat stays off the shelves in the uk so we are having victories along the way um and, uh, so yeah so um but yeah we never expected to be <laughs> running an NGO, but that's what happens in our in you know in our field that we want to combine our you know advocacy with our filmmaking yeah. And you said you received some criticism. I can't imagine that anybody would have any arguments against what you're saying. Uh, what kind of backlash is there to your work? Well, of course, you know, uh, people want to hang on to this story. I mean, the story actually started way back in uh, colonial times when white people first came to Australia, where they really wanted the landscape to be more European and to turn it back into some sort of England, some sort of European landscape. And we had a lot of our wildlife here that has been, you know, a problem for pastoralists and uh, people who wanted to clear the landscape and recreate it into a different version of what they believed it should look like. And that's kind of continued this. It's been handed down, hasn't this it? This fight for generations that somehow kangaroos are, shouldn't be on the landscape. They've been in Australia kind of uh, evolving for the last 20 million years. So they're incredibly suited to the Australian landscape. They cope with droughts and they cope with floods. And I mean, they're really great for living on this landscape and adapting. So, and of course, they're a huge part of the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So it seems a no brainer that we would love them and care for them and respect <laughs> them and want to coexist with them. But it's when you're dealing with sort of an entrenched paradigm of um, removing things from the landscape to suit your farming farming needs right. you don't want to give that up yeah yeah yeah. I understand it's so culturally ingrained isn't it the same way that I mean I guess we're taking away bullfighting now and people are starting to realize that but it's taken so many years of it being normalized and you know ingrained yeah. in culture uh, but you had a film that sparked my eye uh that looked like it was about yoga can you tell me anything about that <laughs> Well, we were looking at different, I mean, obviously when you're looking at people that are making social change, I think one of the things that we found most interesting with the yoga as I mean, I've been doing yoga for like 40 something years and we wow. knew that over the time it, it had really changed from being this kind of small thing that you knew everyone that was doing it in the country to like suddenly it was appearing on like ads on television and we went, boy, it's got popular. You know, yeah, billboards. What are people looking for? Like we knew what we were doing yoga for, but we were like, what is generally people looking for? And, you know, we noticed the classes were full of women and we went down the pathway of going, what are women now using yoga for? Because all our teachers back in the day were men and coming out of India, a lot of men were the gurus of yoga. And it, it had been mostly practiced by men for even for war and for, I mean, it's an amazing tradition and like the soul of yoga remains in India. But what has happened in the West is that people have started to adapt it for what their lives are, what's happening in their lives. So, you know, that people who studied in India were bringing it back to work with women with menopause or work with women in jails or particularly we found women were just finding it incredibly useful for their daily life. And we thought, we thought that we, I mean, it, it's a phenomenon, isn't it? It, I mean, it turned into a, a phenomenon. It's a yeah. phenomenon when you look at what's happened to yoga in the West, that it's a, it is, it is female led. And we just, we saw that as a really interesting story. Yeah. So we had the great good fortune of interviewing how many women? Oh, like I think it was like 50. 50 women that, that are le leaders in the yoga movement. And, uh -huh. and yeah, we, we think it's a very powerful look at, at, at how yoga has been adapted in the West. And, um, yeah, it's, it was, again, these people inspired us. So we just expect, you know, we just assumed that it would inspire the viewer. Um, yeah. And, yeah, it's been a very successful film. It's had a lot of sales and a lot of... You um, practice, you know, I do, yeah. I've got a daily mm -hmm. practice as well. 
thanks to thanks to Kate, thanks to Kate, who's a <laughs> who's a yoga teacher. So that that was uh, the. Say, are you a yoga point. teacher, Kate? Wow, is there anything you don't do? <laughs> I don't actually teach yoga anymore. But, yeah, um, yeah. I uh, <laughs> yeah. try. Yeah. And can you tell me about your experiences with the whales? Yeah, boy, that's a big one. That 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 goes way back to when I was growing up in Tasmania, in the south of Tasmania, as a boy. I learned how to surf with the dolphins, and that was just extraordinary because these dolphins would just be looking at you in the waves, going, "This is how you do it. What's your problem?" <laughs> you know, like like they are just the natural. If anyone's ever seen footage of dolphins surfing, you'll know what I'm talking about. They are just natural surfers, and they'd be on the wave beside me, you know, just like wow. come on what's your problem but as but as a result i would then ask well where yeah okay the dolphins are here but where are the big whales i had this fascination when i was young you know like eight or nine years old asking questions about where the big whales were and no one could tell me it was really interesting like it just wasn't talked about and then it wasn't until i was in high school that i learned that the whales were being slaughtered in such numbers that there weren't any left around tasmania and around australia so that's how early my connection with whales go. And then I, um, and then I started to, uh, when I uh, started um, filmmaking professionally, I started to um, volunteer for some of the environmental groups and some of my early work was to do with the anti-whaling movement. And then I met Kate and we started our production company and that led us, um, you know, it was a very timely thing because the film, the film was 20 years ago now. It was a very timely uh, thing to discuss what we should be doing with whales, and and the film is called What to Do About Whales. And so we looked at the, we looked at the countries that are still whaling, and we then looked at the countries that are choosing to watch whales instead. So we filmed in four different two whaling countries and two whale watching countries, and that that was a, again an investigative piece to look at, you know what what is the most appropriate thing to be doing with our wildlife and particularly these flagship species like whales and yeah so we looked at that and it was it was pretty obvious that flagship species you know are an important part of how of learning to love wildlife and whales are just that so that was how what to do about whales was born and and um yeah again it's been a it, that that's been a very in, um, important film for people to watch and and make decisions on on whale conservation. Amazing. Where were the two whale watching countries? Uh, well, we filmed in the USA, which is was a, really the one of the initial um, countries for whale watching on the east coast out of Cape Cod, and in New Zealand, where the Maori community have really um taken up the leadership of whale watching and it's really transformed their community into a sort of powerful member of the town they're they kaitiaki they're the guardians of the whales there and they uh are just leading by example of this sort of great connection to whales off the coast in new zealand so uh it's i mean i guess it sounds like our work has themes and i think the theme would be you know to really just show people uh what's going on and and how they can kind of and just a way to look at these issues and like uh just like we do a lot to celebrate the animal in both kangaroo and whale watching and i mean uh watch about whales we really celebrated the species we recognize as mick said that there's flagship species that people are really attracted to i mean i think 98 percent of people who come to australia want to see a kangaroo in the wild yeah. And, uh, you know, it's not rocket science, uh, it seems with our, I think at last count, we had like a 68 annual billion dollar a year um, tourist, industry. tourist industry. You know, the, the kangaroo industry that kills kangaroos is very small compared to that, of course. And um, like, why wouldn't you watch kangaroos in the wild? Why wouldn't you build that industry? Why wouldn't you work out ways to preserve and protect and really celebrate what you have in in wildlife and you know we feel particularly lucky because we have such wildlife in Australia we still have roaming mobs of kangaroos that you know is magnificent magnificent to, to experience and you know really invite people to come down and see the kangaroos it's a beautiful thing I think we I think we, we've come up it's only recently or maybe it's not recently maybe I'm just thinking it's recently that 
we're really keen to um, always try and find solutions with our projects. Mm. That's not always easy. <laughs> But I think we're always wanting to have that part of our discussion with people to have a solution, not just the fight. I mean, the fight, the fight is important to a point, but we're also really clear to also look for solutions. And I think um, that's been a big part of what we do as well, that, that we want to, you know, maybe that's for our mental health. <laughs> well, we, we want to find solutions. <laughs> yeah, we, we want to find solutions in, 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 this, in the topics that we take on. Mm. Um, I, mean, I think that's the same with eating plants as we saw there was a place for a solution which was delicious food <laughs> that's easy to find yeah. you know and just really welcoming people into that space yeah. to to and to recognize that people don't know everything like some people's jobs are busy yeah. you yeah. don't get to know this we get to know it so we'll let you see it in an hour <laughs> you know like yeah. we'll show you what's happening in this issue around the world in a quick yeah. hour that yeah. you can understand and take take forward and i mean yeah. i guess that's our role as kind of conduits of i reckon i reckon the one thing that i learned on eating plants because you know, it, it has been so, so much fun making eating plants. Let me, I, I won't kid you, but one, one thing, <laughs> I mean, especially compared to kangaroo, which was, which was incredibly difficult. But um, one thing that I, we did get, we did come to a lot was meeting people where they're at, not where we want them to be. And I think I, I think I've spent a lot of my life meeting people where I want them to be. Somehow on eating plants, we did make an intention to meet people where they're at. Yeah. And that's been really interesting on this project, hasn't it? Because mm. as you say, let's let's look at where you're at and let's help you. Because I know people you know, motivating change, isn't it? Let me check and see. Yeah. Let me does anybody have any questions? If not, we continue this. That if anybody's got any questions, pop them in the chat box. But yeah, I think that's so that's such a valuable lesson about how to motivate change in people that might not see things the way that you're seeing them isn't it? You've got to figure out exactly what people's barriers are, what are people, what do people care about, why people might not be able to make changes that we might find very easy, and then trying to communicate that in a way that does have a solution. And I think it mm. can be so difficult with having so many things to care about and having so many issues to even know where to start. But you guys mm. do it in such a nice way and break it down into, well, this is the problem, this is why, and the, the, this is what you can do, and that's empowering. Yeah, and I think, you know, two of the things that I think are really uh, key in eating plants was how many cultures have veganism as yeah, a background, right. yeah, yeah. and like historically have been pretty much vegetable eaters the whole time. We just moved into this unusual animal eating sort of paradigm <laughs> or recently. Yeah. So that's a really big thing. So people who feel attached to their cultural roots often if they just go a few years behind that, we'll find that they didn't eat much meat or animal products at all. So that's a really sort of big unfold that we found in that. You know, I think, I think- And to, um, and to, and to be proud of that, like to, to be proud yeah, of that. Yeah, and to look for that and to not sort of feel sucked into what what currently looks like culture. Mm. You know, we it's easy to think that what we see today is culture or just because we have turkeys for, New Year, we don't have to, I mean, for Thanksgiving or whatever, we don't have to stop there. You know, we're not stuck. Mm. Yeah. We can keep moving. And I think that's a really, uh, we, you know, we've got very ma uh, malleable neural pathways. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we should be motivating people to do that because it's so easy to stay stagnant. But actually when you give people these easy, fun, delicious, healthy solutions that are not just good for us, but also good for the planet and for the animals, then I think that's one of the most incredible ways to motivate change. Are you guys looking forward to your premieres? Yeah, we really, it was really fun. We, we actually have done a couple because we finished a couple of season episodes early. So we've been in Sweden and Mexico sneakily wow. already. <laughs> but we have some uh, more coming up this year, yeah. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for chatting to me. I hope I haven't kept you past your bedtime too much. You can go out partying. You can go out partying right. now. Yeah. Thanks. We're sending, Bye, sending some Take care. Bye. Yeah. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Take Bye. care, everyone. Have a fun day. Hi. We've got Luke here. Hello. Hi, morning. Wasn't that an absolutely brilliant session from the producers of Eating Plants TV? Check out Second Nature Films. They've got some amazing, amazing projects going on. And now we'll take it over to Luke Marsh from Sadna Forest.
Hello. Morning. How are you? Good, good. It's afternoon for me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but very good, very good. How is the the go the program going this morning? It's going well. So we had my first session, uh, which was me presenting about buckets of love, uh, which went really nicely. And then we've just had Kate and Mick who did um, the docuseries Eating Plants TV. I think I've linked it to you before. Yeah, uh, yeah. So yeah. I don't know if you managed to watch any, but you should screen them in the forest. They are amazing. Yes. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, so that's going well. We've got a really good lineup planned for today. Um, so yeah, like I introduced you this morning, obviously you had a session last year at our first. Yeah, when was that last year? Book, was because April. I wanted to know what I needed to update because a lot has happened. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. But why don't you just give us a full recap of what Sadna Forest is doing, go back to the beginning, and then we can talk about what's yeah. been going on. Yes. So my name's Luke. I'm a long-term volunteer at Sadana Forest. I've been living here for more than six years now. So we're a vegan community uh, working on reforestation and primarily working with local people in planting food producing trees around their homes. This will give them long-term food security and self-sufficiency. So the model that we're trying to replicate is to go to vulnerable areas where people are suffering from malnutrition in severely eroded, deforested areas. Uh, so we currently have projects in uh, Haiti, Kenya, Namibia, and five projects in India. And we're working yeah, with, um, yeah, creating forests to um, uh, reverse desertification and to bring uh, resilience to these vulnerable communities. And so one, when a lot of people kind of see Sadhana Forest, they see us as being a reforestation project. Um, and then you see how we live and then people say, okay, you're a community because we're all working together. We're eating together, living together. And, but the truth is the core of Sadhana Forest, the heart of what we're trying to do as an organization um, is to create a culture, an environment, a space where we can explore together uh, how to live in a more compassionate way. So how to put compassion into action in our different aspects of our lives. So we're looking at how to be compassionate towards the environment. So that's where the reforestation things come in. We're doing water conservation work. We're living in a sustainable way, reducing waste as best we can, living in natural buildings, um, all these kind of different things. Uh, also, we're an off-grid community. So all of our electricity is solar powered. Uh, so we're not connected to any of the electrical dr uh, grid at all. And we're also looking at how we can be compassionate towards people by creating a culture of giving and sharing. So um, we um, pray to practice this idea of gift culture as much as possible. So the idea of giving without expecting anything in return. So we, we were working, li living very successfully as a community and uh, we were exploring how to expand that out even more. So um, we can live together in a sustainable way, but what more can we do? So how we can start giving and sharing and working with vulnerable people in um, different areas of the world. And uh, yeah, we have more than 10,000 visitors that come a year. So these people we are sharing free vegan food with and um, yeah, many different things that we're, we're, we're doing to kind of normalize and uh, socialize this, this idea of gift culture, gift economy. And we're also looking at how to be compassionate towards people by creating a culture of collaboration and not competition because with competition, you always have a winner, but you also always have a loser. And we've really normalized this, this idea in such a deeply rooted aspect of modern day society where there's people that are always winning, but there's people that are always losing. And so what we're experimenting, we're, we're, we're focused on having a strong intention is to explore how to live in a collaborative way, in a cooperative way. So where we're working together and uh, growing together, not this more individualistic type of living where... It's kind of I try and do stuff for myself and um, um, which is very, yeah, maybe normalized. We can see in modern day society, we look at how we can be compassionate towards children by creating a stimulating environment for them to learn through their own curiosity. So we're not telling children, this is what you need to do. This is what you need to learn. This is who you need to become. You have to go to school. You have to do this and do that. We practice this idea of unschooling, also known as natural learning, where Children can learn naturally in their environment um, through creating yeah, a stimulating place. We're an international community. We have people 
all around the world. People from more than 50 different countries come here every year. So in a space like this, you can create so much a stimulation for children to, to learn in so many different ways. And I say to people, it feels like I'm traveling around the world, but everyone comes to my home. And if you're familiar with the expression, it takes a village to raise a child. We can see this really in action in the communities that we're living in because the whole community is coming together, supporting the families that are living there, seeing how we can um, uh, support them. So we're also looking at how we can be compassionate towards animals. And that's where we arrive at this idea of living in a vegan uh, community. So we're not uh, taking, exploiting, using any animals. We're looking at how we can give to animals. Uh, we have an animal sanctuary. We've rescued cows. All the cows that we have in our community were all destined to go to a slaughterhouse. And we were able to give them a different opportunity at life. And, and we communicate all these values a lot um, because we're living, we're living in this very strong, intentional way. And, and it's, um, the interesting thing is these, these ideas, these values are all so very much connected because humans, we often look at the environment and say, what can we take from it? We look at people and say, what can we take from them? We look at animals and say, what can we take from them? Here we can show people that we can create a, um, a, an environment, a, a space where we can look at what we can give to the environment, what we can give to people and what we can give to animals and, and start socializing these ideas. And um, this is kind of the heart of Southern Forest, exploring this and um, we now have um, yeah, more than 15,000 people that have volunteered over the years. Um, it, was, it was started 20 years ago. Uh, we just um, celebrated our 20th anniversary on the 19th of December. And um, yeah, it was a very beautiful time and, and very um, uh, powerful to kind of introspect and observe and reflect um, what the life is, has been like, the evolution, the journey of Sadhana Forest, because it was just started by a small family. And it was never meant to be like this. It was just meant to be small families living together, planting trees. But then people came from all around the world and started to, to come together and show this, this people power that we, we have and what we can do and achieve when we come together. And Yurit, uh, one of the founders, um, she said to me, her biggest fear when starting Sadhana, Sadhana Forest was that the trees would never grow. Because it was in such a desertified, dry, arid environment where really tough conditions and um, yeah, it was a really, really um, tough place to to uh, do land restoration and regeneration, bringing back the native forest. And and now we see a huge forest, and and that's very powerful because lots of people they they talk about humans as being this this cancer, this parasite we're destroying and destructing everywhere we go and. Here we can show people it doesn't have to be like that. You can not only live in a sustainable way, but you can live in a way that dramatically improves the environment around you. And this is what what we're trying to show and to share and to to live um, in these kind of ways. And so that's that's like in short side in a forest um, what we're aiming to do, what we're what we're doing. And yeah, so it's 20, twenty years now. So. Twenty years, yeah. Um, what did you do for the twentieth anniversary? First of all. Um, we didn't really do much. Um, we're actually going to try and celebrate it um, in a few weeks' time because um, Aviram and Yurid, the founders, uh, they weren't there at the time because they were in Namibia um, where we were starting the new project, uh, which I can talk a little bit more about um, mm -hmm. today. And uh, So uh, we had a little celebration, but we're going to try and have a proper celebration when they're here um, with them. Uh, so tell yeah. me about their background. How did... How did they? How did they end up there? And how, what was their background? Like, what were they thinking? Um, had they been to India before? Like, what? How did Sadhana Forest start? What was their intention? Yeah. So, like, before um, Yurichi was an architect, and Aviram was like a CEO in a pharmaceutical company, um, and they, um, yeah, were deciding that they didn't want to live Where this did they life, live? and they wanted it in Israel. Okay. Um, and they wanted to leave Israel and um, to travel the world to find a, a place that they feel more connected to living. And um, they, they came to India and connected with India straight away. As soon as they arrived, they said, OK, this is where we're going to live. And they didn't know where or what they were going to do. But this was something very clear for them from the from the beginning. And then um, after um, some time, uh, they came across Oroville and decided this would be the place that they would um, start. And Oroville is uh, an experimental township in human unity. It was started um, yeah, over 50 years ago now, I think maybe 54, 
coming up to that, something like this. And um, yeah, created to, um, yeah, with the idea of um, bring, bring humanity together and to create um, a city of the future where to explore different ways of living. And uh, so they said, okay, they're going to join Oroville. And then they joined Oroville and then um, they started volunteering at a farm. But in this farm, they were um, not, is not, not a vegan farm. So they, they felt very disconnected to this kind of way of living and they didn't want to have anything to do with the animal uh, animals there on the animal products so it didn't really work out for them there and then they said okay we'll um, find a different thing to do and they were, um, they were exploring what they wanted to do and something that was very clear for Aviram is he wanted nothing to do with money and someone came up to them one time and said um, I know what you need to do in Oroville um, you need to do indigenous reforestation you'll never make any money planting trees so they said okay uh, let's explore this they didn't know anything really about reforestation and this kind of work but they they said okay and they got a piece of land uh, 70 acres of land uh, so in Oroville there's no private property we're just uh, caretakers of the land so they got 70 acres of heavily deforested um, um, eroded land and then they um, said okay we're gonna lift it and start um, planting trees and then a volunteer came and another volunteer came and it just grew and grew to one of the largest residential volunteer projects Wow. And how many people reside there at one time now? Uh, so it's between like 30 and 100 people staying there any one time. Right now, I think the community is about 70 people. Wow. And um, yeah, uh, but so we have um, a, a long term team, uh, people that are staying like at least one year. So that's about 20, 25 people. And then we have uh, lots of short term volunteers that are coming. Like we have mid what we call mid term volunteers, people staying a few months. And then short term volunteers, people staying a week, two weeks, three weeks, something like that. And so how did you find out about the project? I know you did tell us last year, but for everybody yeah, that might not have been no listening, problem. what's your background? How did you end up there? And how long have you yeah. been there? Yeah, so yeah, it's been, yeah, I've been saying six years, but it's six and a half years now. I've been saying six years, so half a year. Um, <laughs> so I was basically wanting to travel around the world to find a different way to live. And I came across Oroville as being kind of one of these more alternative communities in the world. It's kind of the most established one. Uh, the oldest experiment and I said okay if, so if I was going to travel to different places but I wanted to start there and I was looking for places to stay in Oroville and I found Southern Forest I had a two month visa so I said okay I'll be two months in Oroville and two, the first two weeks I'll spend in Southern Forest and then long story short I found a better way to live so so I I decided to stay there and to live there and I've been involved in the, I spent one year in the project in Haiti and then being involved in starting the new projects in India. And yeah, it's my home. Yay. Uh, so tell us about starting new projects. What have you been working on? Uh, how was Haiti, for example? Yeah, so Haiti um, has been going on for 13 years now. Um, so that was uh, started in response to the earthquake that they had in 2010, like the most deadly natural disaster in uh, recent history. Um, so that was done there. Then in Kenya, it was in 2014. Uh, Namibia um, was done uh, just in the last six months. Mm -hmm. And um, so Namibia is very um, heavily reliant on goat farming. Uh, Kenya is cattle farming and Haiti is uh, fishing. Uh, it's like we're in a fishing village. So they're very um, reliant on animal products. But um, due to climate change and um, ecosystems collapsing, these are not kind of viable um, secure food sources for these people anymore. Um, the fisher fisheries are being depleted. Uh, um, the rate of droughts um, and um, desertification is made like animal directly caused by animal farming has made is making animal farming less and less uh, uh, practical and possible. So we can come in with a plant based solution to work with the local people in planting these food producing trees. This will give them yeah long term food security and do mass reforestation in the process. And um, these trees will give food for generations and they're uh, drought resistant trees as well. And so in times of droughts, when maybe the crops fail and um, the animals will start uh, dying out, this becomes like a lifeline for these people. So it's a, a really effective way to naturally transition uh, vulnerable communities to plant based diets, um, just giving them the option to plant these trees around their homes in their private land. And then so we've done, we got the four projects in India as well. One of the main reasons that I'm super interested in what you guys are doing is one, because it's absolutely amazing. Um, and two, mm -hmm. because I'm really intrigued as to how you communicate 
with local communities where their culture has been so reliant on, for example, fisheries or cattle farming, but then you're coming as as international people and as foreigners and saying we know better which we've got the evidence to suggest that but how do you communicate that effectively to try and elicit change in communities where they might have cultures that are so ingrained and may, may not have the resources to, to start changing how they live yeah it's, it's interesting because we don't even have to to create much of a conversation around it because the they know they um they know that the fisheries are being depleted they they hear what they was like 10 years ago 20 years ago their parents grandparents and they would go out and come back with um like abundance of fish and that's not the reality for them anymore um so they they know that they need to find a different way of doing things so we come with one way of doing things we're not saying what they're doing is wrong what they're doing is bad um what they're doing is problematic or anything like that we're coming just from a solutions-based alternative to say this is something that you can try and um, it was interesting because um, a lot of the people when we start the projects are more skeptical about us and um, yeah, kind of say, okay, no, we don't want you, you to plant trees around the home. Like they don't know what we're, like we have to, we have an agenda or anything like that. But then a few people um, are open to it and they start planting trees. We start planting trees with them and realizing that we're very genuine about it. And then over the years, a more and more trust is built up and more and more people are open to this. And then, eventually these trees are producing food and they're seeing these these people with the same land as they have with these beautiful trees around their homes around the land producing so much food and mm -hmm. then like everyone wants the trees then so um it's the it's the idea that the social work to do in these areas it's a it cannot be done in one two three years five years whatever it needs to be long-term projects to, to have permanent uh, centers um, in these areas because it we from our experience it takes about three to five years to build up um, this level of trust with local communities yeah. and most NGOs that are working in spaces like this will only um, have short-term projects for like three to five years so um, which yeah doesn't really make uh, much sense from the experience that we've had uh, so yeah it's more about we're just doing and uh, we give them the choice and yeah, um, yeah they ask questions they and they, we, they are always offering us um, animal products or tea with milk in or anything like that. And we just explain that we don't eat it. And they say, why? And we explain why. And we've had very interesting encounters with like um, people in tribal villages. Like, for example, the Samburu tribe in Kenya. Um, they, they were asking us about why we don't eat animals. And we're explaining them and we explain how the animals are treated in um in these environments um in the the west and they they said like wow like yeah if i was in that environment i would be vegan too um mm. so it's interesting once you start creating this trust you can start finding this common ground and start building up these connections so um yeah it's it's been very effective i believe and especially like haiti has been the, the hardest place to build this because there's been a lot of foreign involvement and a lot of exploitation so they're very skeptical foreigners right um, so but it's been going very successful there good and now i saw some photos that jazz sent me recently of namibia yeah so that's super super so, that's super super new isn't it that's gonna take yeah. some time which is exciting so how, how's that going yeah. Yeah, so yeah, it's kind of in the last six months, things have really been starting um, starting there and we're working with the Himba tribe. Um, so H-I-M-B-A, um, Himba. Uh, it's a super interesting, fascinating tribe that, um, that unlike a lot of tribes in the, in the world where they've started to be kind of globalized, westernized and have this kind of uh, Western influence, these, this uh, Himba tribe is is really taking pride in keeping their, their traditions and cultures and you can you can just see it when you see the photos of them and, and how they're living. And um, so there's so much that we can learn from them and um, to, to be living with them for the people that have experienced that. They've just had these surreal, like amazing experiences. So, so yeah, we got the land, um, about 30 acres of land, I believe. And then um, we've been starting to build the infrastructure. So a couple of months ago, we managed to uh, um, get access to water on the land because it's in a very dry, desertified area and we had to dig a bore well. Um, and it's kind of um, it's kind of unknown whether you actually find water 
um, underground in these lands. Um, so, and yeah, it's very important to have this, to be able to have a living functional community. So yeah, we, we dug three wells. The first two uh, were not successful. Um, but then the third one, um, we were able to um, find water. Um, so that was uh, really amazing. And so that's really, um, yeah, allowed the, the project to, to really start thriving. And then yeah, just starting to build the basic infrastructure, uh, working with um, universities in Namibia, around um, the um, identifying the local species because we're only planting native trees, uh, native food producing trees or uh, the idea of naturalized species as well. What does that uh, mean? So yeah, there's been a, uh, naturalized is, so native is um, trees that have always kind of been there, but naturalized are trees that over time um, have been kind of um, like you could say maybe like selectively bred over hundreds of years or thousands of years um, to be able to be resilient within these um, in these eco ecosystems. So um, uh, yeah, there's because it's a very a very tough place, um, and um, yeah, there's not um, we're we're very limited on just the native tree, uh, tree species. But if you start looking at naturalized ones that have been there for hundreds of years, um, that are just, uh, growing very well and um, not causing a problem for the ecosystem and all these kind of things um because after this amount of time it's very easy to, to identify that yeah. um then yeah that's that's been going very well so yeah we've we've had very successful experiences in the nurseries that we've been creating um there have been um trees that we've been propagating that people find very challenging to propagate um and we've had a lot of success with this uh so yeah this is very exciting for the universities that we're working with but also the, the project as well and uh, I will be there in two weeks and I'm very excited yeah. for your upcoming um, Vegan Forest Festival part two. So how's that Absolutely. going? How was the first one and how are you feeling about the next one? Yeah, so the first one was just amazing. It's a, we, we do a, we're starting to do an annual vegan festival where uh, people are coming from all around India and different countries like yourself. And it's, it's it's something that's very unique and it's very special to be a part of because um, we the, the the movement in the the vegan movement in India is growing a lot um, in the last few years and the the vegan movement in like a lot of countries let's say the UK is very established now um, there's the kind of the very deeply rooted kind of organisations and groups and um, influences that had a lot of um, yeah influence in in navigating which direction the movement went and um, we can kind of learn, uh, learn a lot from other countries where maybe people are coming from very kind of more kind of violent aggressive negative looking at problems judging kind of directions that vegan movements have kind of um, had a lot of uh, retaliation from um, we can look at places where it's become more maybe um, not accessible for underprivileged people more kind of elitist um and yeah kind of these kind of different things that um has happened um not not everywhere and, um by all means not um in every aspect of vegan uh, movements in the world but uh, we can we can reflect on this and say okay how we can start navigating and, and directing uh, the vegan movement here in india in a very compassionate community community based um solution based uh sustainable um, and accessible environment. So we have a lot of people doing talks and it's really important for us for the people that are doing talks. They're not, they're not looking at problems, um, coming from a negative, judgmental kind of blaming um, culture, but looking at positive solution-based solution um, um, alternatives and talking about these things and um, really kind of bringing people together. And um, yeah, it's completely free as well. So there's no entry fee and we're, uh, cooking all the food for everyone as well. So um, Southern Forest is completely run by volunteers. So all of our uh, team are coming and yeah, preparing the food for everyone. And um, it's we we're living in a community and we're doing the festival in the community. So we don't really have to build any extra infrastructure to do this. We kind of have everything in place to have this festival. And I think this makes it very unique because it's very sustainable. Because um, if you look at the way we deal with water in the community the way we, we shower we wash our dishes um, and wash our hands we have all these great water systems where the water is going back to um, to the ground we have the solar system 
uh, to to power the community. Um, we're eating uh, local organic plant based food, um, and uh, yeah, living in um, uh, uh, people are staying in tents, but all the talks and things are happening in huts, in natural buildings, and things like this. So to to have a festival in a space like this, I think um, is very unique in the, the sustainability aspect as well. Compost toilets, um, comp- uh, food compost, all these kind of different things. So, and that's already set up in our community. So we just have to scale it up and that's um, very easy for us to do. Well, not easy, but possible. Um, so, you make it look easy. Yeah. After I saw the Instagram um, videos from last year, you guys make it look easy. How's the food prep going? Yeah, yeah, we're, it's been exciting for the last few weeks because we've been really kind of playing with the menu. We really nailed the food um, last year. Like everyone was like amazed with it. So um, we're, we're expecting to have like between 500 and 700 people this wow. year. And we've never kind of cooked for that many people, let alone cooking for that many people for free meals, free days. Um, so, um, yeah, usually we'll have like one chef cooking a meal. But um, for this, because it's such large quantities, um, let's say for lunch where we have like a rice dish, dish a, a veggie dish, a salad and like a dal or something like that. So where it would usually be one chef cooking for everything. We have like one chef doing the salad, one chef doing the okay. veggies, one chef doing the dal, one chef doing the rice. So we've been putting all of our um, super chefs um, uh, practicing, kind of playing with the menu, um, playing with the recipes and kind of getting feedback from our team. And um, yeah, so we've got a really, really exciting, um, delicious menu of yeah, whole food. Um, uh, yeah, local foods to okay. share with everyone. So we've probably got a couple of minutes. So if anybody wants to put any questions, then please ask. But if not, I really wanted to ask you, about compost toilets so can you tell us about your compost toilet system yeah yeah i'm very happy to talk about compost toilets uh, my favorite thing to talk about <laughs> uh, so it just really so... distresses me the water systems here i can't believe we're using clean water to get it's just so stressful yeah. Yeah, when I talk about compost toilets, I, I think it's really important to, to understand this context of how our food system and sewage system works in kind of more more um, the, the globalized world, where if you look at nature, um, you look, let's say we're an animal that eats a plant, the plant is taking the nutrients from the ground, the animal eats the plant, it digests the plant, then it poops it out, and then all the nutrients go back into the ground. There is this symbiosis with the natural world, and this has been able to work for... Um, forever um, this is the definition of sustainability because you're taking something out from the environment and it goes back into it we've created a dis- disconnect in that cycle where we are eating a lot of uh we're we're growing food it's taking all the nutrients from the ground we eat the food we digest it and then we poop it out and all of the nutrients um are just being wasted away in a toxic sewer system this is the definition of us unsustainability because we can't keep doing this for future generations because um, the, we're seeing already the lands becoming completely depleted. So we're having to kind of mitigate this by using chemical fertilizers and things like this. And this um, this starts to yeah cause a lot of problems um, for the microorganisms and bacteria into the soil and insects and wildlife and all these kind of different things. So um, yeah, compost toilets is this idea of everything going back into the ecosystem. We've reconnected that natural way of doing things, that natural cycle, cycle, that symbiosis. And so if you truly want to live in a sustainable way, we need to really re- yeah, reconnect that it. huge cycle that we have. Thank you. I've got one question from lovely Louis. Bonjour, Louis. He must be in France doing his sustainability things. And so I can't wait to hear about that. Louis would love to hear about how the farming works, organic or regenerative. Thank you. Um. So when we... Uh, uh, talking about farming, yeah, people often talking it from like a human centric perspective, so growing food for humans. So, in our main project that we have, we're not growing uh, any food, um, we're buying the food from at the outside because uh, we're focusing all our, our energy on um, the indigenous reforestation because that's the biggest need for the, the, the bioregion to bring back this native forest that's been pushed almost to extinction. So, there's lots of people growing food for humans in the world, but there's very few people. Um, doing indigenous reforestation. So in this project, we're focused more on this. But in our other projects, we're working with the local people in the tribal villages around agroforestry and food forestry. So how you can grow food forest, integrating it with agriculture, um, using their kind of local local techniques. And yeah, it's all connected to uh, yeah permaculture and just this um, yeah regenerative type of living is yeah this idea of if we're using something yeah, and it's going back and this can keep being done and keep being sustained. 
So, um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Luke. I will see you in a couple of weeks. I'm really excited to come and see your home. Oh, excited for you to be here. I'll see you soon. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you for organising this. Take care. Bye-bye. That's brilliant and very exciting to hear from Sandra Forrest again. So nice updates there. So shall we take it over to lovely Amelia Lee? Have we got Amelia here? Yeah, I'm Hello. here. Hi, Hi, how are you? It's very nice to be here. I don't know nice if you heard my here. introduction about you before, but I was like, she does this and she does this and she does this. <laughs> she's a lawyer and she does podcasts and she's a magazine editor and she's rewilding. Oh my gosh. No, this is great. And I was really delighted to hear. Uh, well, first, I'm delighted to be here. So thank you so much. And it's really fantastic to connect with you as well. So this is great. It's and so again, nice to, see to you. hear about Sadhana Forest, which is someplace I've wanted to go and visit and Auroville as well, which is again, someplace I'd wanted to go and visit. Come on, two weeks. I know. Yeah. So you'll have to, I'm going to, uh, please post photos. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be all over that. I really want to see, see it all. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you. Very well. Uh, yeah. And, um, and, and again, some of the things uh, that uh, we just talked about with Luke, he really um, resonated um, he said a couple of things about uh, reforesting doesn't make money, totally. Uh, I, so I related to a bunch of, the, of of things that he said. Um, but if you want, I've got a presentation, a bit of a presentation that I can kind of fly through. If I'd love that, let's do that. Let's do are that. Interested? So let me um, share a screen and do that. Uh, can can you see that? Yes, it says yeah, yeah, great, fantastic. Okay, so um, I am just going to talk a little bit about what rewilding is and what it looks like from a conceptual basis. What we're doing in Scotland and what our project is all about, why it's important, why veganism fits into it, and, and all that. Um, hopefully, this works. Yes. So I'll give you a quick intro tell you a little bit about what happened to the forest in Scotland and uh, then worldwide, what's rewilding, what we're doing, and what we can do um, to rewild ourselves and our the world around us. So uh, there's a little bit about me. So I'm the author, of, of co-author of Think Like a Vegan, What Everyone Can Learn from Vegan Ethics podcast, and Think Like a Vegan, and so on, some other stuff. But the main uh, focus here that I want to bring you to is uh, Birchfield, our project. It's a uh, hundred acres of former commercial forest, and it's in the highlands of Scotland, um, just south of Inverness and south of Loch Ness. So really far north, which is an important thing to to keep in mind. And um, what's interesting about um, being up there. Um, and, and about rewilding in general is you learn to read the environment. You learn to read, um, it's like a new language really, because you're looking at a hill and you think, oh, this is what the hill always looked like, right? And this is what Scotland looks like. It's kind of empty and there's a little bit of trees here and there and so forth. But is that the full story? So um, we got to go back. We got to go back in time and think about how things changed. Um, when humans started uh, agriculture about 10,000 years ago, they, we, I should say, not they because it's us, fundamentally changed the relationship that we have um, with our environment. And uh, agriculture brought about lots of uh, deforestation. And by the time the Romans arrived in Britain, and that is in uh, 52 AD, um, the 50% of the forests of Britain were already gone. So it's not a new, uh, it's not a new phenomenon. Again, like, to get away from the idea that we are just doing bad things now or anything like that. And so I, I want to, you know, so that we can look at things in a, in a wider, with a wider lens. Then what happened 
to uh, what happened to the rest of the forests. So you have empire building, you have colonialism, you have fuel and leather tanning, all of these things. How do you think the ships got built that participated, uh, that were, were the most important things, or one of the most important things in empire building and colonialism, and an important tool was the ships. Where do you think the wood came from? Certainly came from the forests here. So again, when we are looking at colonialism, it's what happens both in the place that's colonized and what happens back home, quote unquote, as well. The, there's negative effects everywhere. So like there's always two sides of an equation, just like in math. Um, and then obviously wood was used for fuel and it was also used for, for leather tanning and all of these things were all going on. Then you've got the clearances in the 1800s. In, and this particularly is in Scotland. So the clearances in Scotland basically um, meant that uh, large landowners um, kicked out all of the, uh, the smallholder farmers who were on their land. They were tenant farmers. And they instead imported sheep. There were sheep in Britain before that, um, but to a lesser extent. So they imported sheep. Sheep are not native to Britain. Sheep are native to the Middle East. And uh, they were brought to Britain um, early on by Neolithic people. But I'll get to that in a second. We'll talk about sheep in a second. Um, anyway, so clearances, more deforestation. Bunch of sheep on the big hills that you see here in the picture. And they're munching away, doing the thing that sheep do. Then after that, so you've got the 1800s, you've got the development of large shooting estates, and then you have commercial forestry. So all of that brings us to the 19th century. And that's when people started saying, oh, gosh, well, maybe we should have some more forests. And by that time, by the 19th century, which wasn't that long ago, the woodland cover was 5% of Britain, not just Scotland, Britain. Um, then you have sheep. Very briefly, I'll talk about sheep. Um, there's between 23 and 33 million sheep, depending um, at the point of time uh, of, of the year, um, in Britain at any point in time. And, uh, um, and well, they ruminate. They, they eat all sorts of plants on the ground and, and so forth. And as you can see, I just go through briefly where they're from. Um, and why you're saying, well, what do sheep have to do with forests? Well, when you have trees can't naturally regrow if someone's eating them and, and the way that sheep work, they don't necessarily eat the buds of trees, but they eat lots of the grasses that are around it. And, and they kind of create this very, um, uh, decertified area. Let me just go back. So you see in this picture, you see how this picture has has a very empty landscape. And then if you take a look along um, the bottom here of the photograph, there are trees in that gully. That's what Scotland would have looked like. There would have been trees all out along the top of these hills. So when you're looking at a landscape and you see it empty, try to have a look at where there's gullies, where the animals, whether they're sheep or deer or people, can't get to it. And you'll see a little bit more of what it looked like. So Scotland didn't always look empty. Scotland had trees and you get a hint of that at the bottom there. And that's what I meant earlier about reading a landscape and it being a new language, I would have just thought in, in the past I did, oh, well, that's how the, the, the hills are. There's just kind of empty. And then, oh, there's a few trees there because there's a river. And although that's true, yes, there's trees because there's a river, but there's also there's trees there because they weren't cut down because there was inconvenient. Um, so anyway, so you've got sheep, um, then you've got land use. I don't know, some of you may have seen this uh, uh, this um, chart. Um, 
and uh, it's a chart, it's a current chart of what land use in, in Britain looks like. Um, and it's not a chart, a, a geographic chart, it's a, a it's purpose. So if you take a look at what Britain uses its land for, you'll see that it's mostly for pastures, uh, dairy pastures, beef and lamb pastures, and everything else is really tiny. And then um, next to it, the overseas land that we use to then feed ourselves. And again, look at the giant thing that uses uh, beef and lamb pastures. And all of that contributes to deforestation. All of the, the pastures, all of the, the fields that we use, as we all know, um, to grow particularly soya beans, which are then, um, uh, uh, well, made into animal feed. Most of the soya is put into animal feed, not to human food. Global land use, again, you can you can see this chart. 50% um, of habitable land is used for agriculture, 77% of that for livestock, meat, and dairy, 18% of calories, and only 37% of habitable land is forests. So that's forests, why we don't have them anymore. And why is that a problem? Obviously, biodiversity. Biodiversity is extremely important. It's extremely important to, to ourselves as well as to the, the uh, uh, beings who live in the forest. And, I, and by that, I mean animals, insects, uh, uh, trees, uh, fungi. Uh, it's, it's everyone. And it's important to us as well. So what's rewilding? Um, rewilding basically is a way to, it's an idea to restore ecosystem and reverse the biodiversity declines. And primarily one hopes to do it by not touching the land or leaving it to um, naturally regenerate and do its thing. And in many cases you can do that, but in some cases you can't. Um, just like at Sadhana Forest, you have to either introduce some native trees or if they're not native, the, those that are um, that are have been adapt that are adapted to growing in the in the environment, and also because of climate change and um, uh, tree diseases and so forth, there's different trees that can no longer grow here. So you have to look at other trees that will grow here. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, to the extent we can, we uh, uh, leave the land alone. But a lot of times you can't do that. So how are you going to rewild? What are, what is the sort of overarching structure? And we uh, follow these 10 principles. I won't go through each one. Um, and they're um, uh, promulgated by the IUCN. And uh, basically, it tries to look at rewilding and put it in a framework that uh, considers the local, the human, the, the knowledge, tries to look a little bit forward. What do we need to keep in mind? What do we need to anticipate? Um, and we need to um, have the evidence of what, what's the scientific evidence uh, and so forth. And um, one of the, the, the principles I really like is, is to recognize the intrinsic value of all species. Because sometimes in conservation, you can get this, this micro focus, like, oh, only X animal, only Y tree, only Z insect, you know, and, and then we forget about everyone else. Um, and, and to some extent, that's done because of necessity and, and because there's a lot. Um, and when you're trying to rewild, there is a lot. Because every time you learn one thing or you're doing one thing, you realize, oh, wait, this is going to have an impact I hadn't yet thought about. So basically, if we then try to bring it all together, um, and I, the 10th principle is really great, the paradigm shift in coexistence of humans and nature, this idea that we are somehow um, uh, separate from nature is, is really... Uh, it's really narrow and focused because obviously we're part of nature and whatever happens to quote nature is going to affect us. So it's not like 
you know, we live in a city and therefore we're not in the natural environment. Of course we are. It's a different natural environment, but it's, it, it's still all part of it. And everything that happens out there happens, happens here. And by here, I mean to humans and to nature. So what we're doing at Birchfield, we're um, restoring the native forest to the extent we can. And I can get into that. If people are interested. The, we're restoring the peat bog and funga. And we are looking at and hoping to restore locally extinct species. We're looking at wood ants in particular um, for next year. And uh, we also are trying to inspire people to connect with the environment. So often we have um, visitors come or artists come, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. And uh, the one of the other things that we try to do is we've put vegan ethics at the fun, as a fundamental part of the project. Um, we ask everyone who stays on the site to consume only plant-based foods. And this is great. There's lots of people who are involved and lots of people who come and work with us, um, work. We collaborate with, with a, a number of people. Um, uh, we collaborate with ACOM, which is a big infrastructure company. We collaborate with the University of Cumbria, uh, with an NGO called Lifescape Project, um, and uh, local our local uh, forest manager. Um, and uh, we exchange uh, knowledge and time and experiences we provide uh, a, a place where ACOM, for example, as a big company, they want to try new techniques, great, try them at our place. So we don't have uh, a specific, well, we have a, a, a wide goal, but how we get there, we're happy to try whatever we can and, and take whatever learning from that um, as, as a, a way forward. So some people are vegan and some people are not. And we obviously, deforestation, um, one of the big drivers of deforestation is animal-based agriculture. Um, and so it makes no sense to not be vegan while you're trying to rewild, reforest and all of that. So we try to bring that into focus. And um, we've never had anyone say no or argue the point or anything like that, which is nice. And um, so th this is the fancy stuff that we do. Um, the fancy stuff that we do. I don't because I'm not a scientist. I just help to the extent that I can. Um, and then there's all sorts of uh, specialists and scientists who are involved. And we, we test these innovative approaches I mentioned a little bit before. Um, we've used drones, AI, and there's remote sensing technologies. Uh, the remote sensing technologies have been really great in measuring the uh, water levels when we are trying to restore the peat bog, as well as uh, CO2 capture. Um, then uh, uh, ACOM is particularly uh, interested in developing a natural capital accounting framework, um, which natural accounting, natural capital accounting can be a bit of a um, uh, controversial topic because people are saying you're putting a, an economic value on nature. And yes, that's true. But the way I see natural capital accounting and the way that we're where we've set up this framework to make it more interesting and engaging and to change that perception is we already do that. We already put a, a, a value on trees, but we only put the value on trees when we are going to extract them, when we're going to cut them. We don't then say on the other side. So, you know, when you're looking at an account, it has the plus side, the debit and credit side, right? So uh, we only say, oh, it's going to cost, it, it's going to, going to cost 100 to take them out and we're going to make 200 when we sell them. So at the end, we have a 100 left. Yes, but you're not then taking into account all the negative stuff that's um, that you can't necessarily see. So you can't necessarily see that you're taking away the amenity from the community, the well-being. And what about the carbon that you're then releasing? 
all of those things have costs. And some people, whether we like it or not, I mean, we live in a non-vegan capitalist world and that is the reality. Um, some people need to see that. They need to see that quantifying and that valuing. And um, and we we hope that by creating these engaging ways of communicating our findings, then we can show people the benefits of rewilding um, in a variety of different ways. And the community engagement that I was mentioning before, which is also part of our principles. So we have artists come and stay and, and create whatever they like. Um, we've had Ever uh, record two of her albums on site. Um, Leon Oldstrong, uh, he's uh, uh, filmed a short um, on site and it's one of the, uh, if not the first or the sole, uh, certainly one of the very few um, uh, primarily uh, Black cast and crew uh, British horror films. And I that is online on Discovery Plus or Disney Plus or actually on YouTube now too. I have, I've got it linked on the website. We've built a hide so that people can uh, pause and look around and uh, uh, watch the birds. There's a variety of wildlife and, and birds in particular um, from osprey, golden eagles to a variety of smaller raptors and tiny songbirds and, and migratory birds, loads. Um, and it's really lovely and obviously loads of insects as well. And um, we've also been featured on BBC Countryfile um, which is really great because Country File isn't necessarily, uh, um, well, it has had more focus on rewilding as of uh, the last few years, um, but we were early on, and it's nice that they're focusing on that. And um, what can we all do? Um, wherever we are, we can be a, a bit more uh, uh, rewilding focused, if you will. Um, we have access to a garden, make it messy. Don't be super neat about it. If something falls and if there's a whole area of grass that you can let it grow and so on, do that. Uh, our, this, this idea that everything has to be neat and tidy um, really diminishes the uh, number of, of habitats um, available for insects and small animals and birds, a variety of, of, of species. And then to change our perspective and relationship with the wild. Again, if we are in, uh, in an urban environment to, to seek out, well, where are the wild places here? What did it look like before? You know, um, and, and if you are uncomfortable with the wild, you know, think about, well, well, why? Why are you uncomfortable with nature? And I mean, maybe, you know, this isn't necessarily the forum where, you know, people would be uncomfortable with nature. Um, probably not. Preaching to the choir, I suppose. But if you are, explore that. Why? Why do you think you're separate? Are you really separate? And then, um, uh, as I said, learning about the area, what did it look like before? And again, assuming you're in a in a, a an, an urban environment, but also assuming you're not in an urban environment, if you are in a more rural environment, have a look around at the hills and the wherever you may be. What might those have looked like before there were farms there? You know, so it's not you know don't assume that your environment always has looked like that. Try to 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 look beyond it and say, oh wait, this looked quite different even if it was hundreds of years ago. And identify where's the wild in your community? Is it just on the verges? If you're on a road, you know, and the verge of the road often tends to be pretty wild. And if you are in a, in a city, um, there may be wild parks or are there parks that could be a little bit more wild and you might have some influence on that. You know, there's, there's loads of different ways. And if you don't have a garden and you can only, you only have a balcony, well, uh, maybe plant some trees and some plants on your balcony, if you can. And of course, if none of those things you can do, the least we can do for a wide variety of reasons is to be vegan. Uh, and that will help um, and to make more vegans, obviously, of course, 
um, and that will help in um, rewilding and uh, defor and decreasing, well, the potential decrease of deforestation. Here's some um, contact details and uh, resources and uh, all of that. Um, and uh, you can screenshot that if you want. If you have any questions, please um, get in touch uh, via email or social media. And um, podcast, I talk about rewilding a little bit. I've had some guests who talk about that in the last season. And um, yeah, my book is available anywhere. And uh, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. I'm going to stop sharing the screen and return. Hi. Hi. That was brilliant. Thank you tried so to, much. Tried to keep it short. Yeah, uh, no, it was perfect timing because that gives us a few minutes to chat. So that was absolutely perfect. So you don't sound Scottish. How yeah. have you ended up buying the land in the Scottish Highlands and why did you choose there? Well, that's uh, that's a great question. Um, so I've been living in the UK for a couple decades um, and my husband uh, was really interested in Scotland. And he was there before I uh, before we met. Um, and then we actually watched. Um, actually, no, let me go back. We read um, George Mambio's book, Feral. And we read about, this was years ago, about, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, maybe a little less. Um, we read about um, a community in Scotland, uh, not too far away from where we were, um, and uh, where there was a, a man a call, who, who's called Alan Watson Featherstone, who uh, set up a charity called Trees for Life. So we went to hear him speak, and... Um, he basically had been uh, reforesting the Caledonian forest in Scotland for decades. And we took a lot of inspiration from him. Then we've also gotten to meet him and to work with him, uh, which was fantastic. He's been vegan for almost 50 years. He's an amazing person. And the, he lives at the Finhorn Foundation. And, Finhorn, and, and he's actually been to Arrowville, which... I was like, oh my gosh, I've always wanted to go there, blah, blah, blah. And he was we telling keep me running about into that. the same people in the conservation community. I love it. Well, exactly that. And every, you know, people who are interested in similar things, um, you know, so that was really fantastic. So basically he was our inspiration, as was Farrell, um, because it led us to him. Um, and we said, well, gosh, you know, maybe, you know, my husband said, well, could we, couldn't we do that? Couldn't we plant some trees? I'm like, I don't know, I suppose so. Mm -hmm. And so we started looking for some land and we found a, a place that made sense for us for a variety of reasons. Because um, again, finding land and finding some place that you feel where you can make a difference can be difficult and daunting because commercial forests are um, really, they can be really sad places. So you need a place also that's going to be, it's going to feel a little bit where there's the opportunity to make a difference. And so we found this place and then we started and then, and then talking with some friends and they said, you know, we said, Hey, you know, we've got these hundred acres. Um, we're thinking of planting some trees. Maybe could we do something more interesting? And so this other friend said, oh, actually, I've had this idea about natural capital accounting and making it more interesting and all of that. And so we said, hey, well, let's see what we can do. And so we did. And so here we are. And so from wow. planting trees only, we have learned so much. And that's actually been the slowest part for a bunch of reasons. But that's been the slowest part of the whole project. Yeah, yeah. Well, it takes time, like we well, like we had from Luke before. It, exactly. exactly. I'm really glad that you highlighted. I think it's so important to emphasize to people that this is not what our our backgrounds and this is not what our scenes should look like when we're driving through, or when we're yeah. going on the train, or when we're walking through fields. It feels very unnatural to me, and yeah. it took a long time for me to realize that. And actually, I think we need to highlight to people that this is not what things should look like. For yeah. example, I went to, I was doing a expedition medicine course in the 
Lake District and then the Peak District more recently. Yeah. Everybody says they're so beautiful, you know, they're so beautiful and the lakes are beautiful, yes. But at the same time, there are no saplings. No. All the, the the grass is completely just cut by the yep. sheep which are roaming exactly. around. Exactly. And yes, it's green, but yep. it's not it's not biodiverse. No. There's no wildlife there. Um, and it's just vast, vast expanses of a field. And yep. actually, I think we should be deconditioning people to, to remind people that this is not what nature should look like. Um, and it is sad when you realize that. But at the same time, it's really motivating because we know what it should look like. Yes. Ex- well, exactly. You know, and when we have visitors come to the site um, and this summer, actually, we're going to have a sort of a regular set of visitors pointing that out yes to some extent you make them sad because you're they're keep they're like oh wow and then they're like oh yeah but those two things well could, they do exist in the same space they can exist at the same time you can think that something is beautiful and also realize oh but wait let me use my imagination and think of it in a different way and then think about how i can make a difference to make that happen so instead of just being, you know, wallowing in the, you know, the sadness room, you can use that. We need for... to use all of this as motivation. Exactly. Exactly. I've I mean, got to leave it at that because I've got my Ecomedics presentation now. Thank you so Thank much. you so I much. I message you today. I really appreciate your time and your work and I'll chat to you soon. Thank you so much. Bye, Amelia. Really Bye, excited. everybody. Bye. Okay, I think we've got over to me now. So I am going to pull up my next presentation, which is a quick one on Ecomedic. So more share screen. Brilliant. Great. So I think you guys can see that. It looks like you should be able to see this. Ecomedics by me. So I was really hoping to have lovely Dr. Nathan Hudson Peacock uh, presenting today, but he has had a family emergency. Um, and so I will be covering for him. And I'm really, really proud and inspired by the work that Ecomedics are doing. I was really, really honored when they asked me to be on the team, probably last year after I think we presented outside parliament at the Extinction Rebellion, the big one, we kind of talked about the work that we were doing in hospitals and realized that there was a huge overlap. And so I'm really, really happy and honored to be on the Ecomedics team. Ecomedics it was founded in 2020 to tackle the climate crisis by encouraging and enabling sustainable behavior amongst healthcare individuals. It started originally with projects tackling single use coffee cups, but now their quality improvement projects are being enrolled nationally. Ecomedics is open to any healthcare professionals concerned about the climate crisis, and they currently host an amazing podcast. They had a conference at the Royal Geographic Society last year, and we're now having regular Ecomedics sharing circles for healthcare professionals who want to network and chat and maybe have a bit of a debrief about any concerns that we've got about the environment. So Ecomedics... We should be having an Ecomedics team in each hospital. So if anybody's interested or knows anybody that might be interested in setting one up, then please just ask them to get in touch. There's loads of amazing projects which you can get involved in. And Ecomedics can always kind of give you ideas about how to implement the projects that that you're interested in. So we might think, why is this important? Because we've already got so much to deal with when we're thinking about the pressures that the NHS is under, when we're thinking about the burden of sick patients, when we're thinking about waiting lists, when we're thinking about the fact that, you know, there aren't enough rooms or beds or appointments for patients. But we've got so much to think about. So why should we be prioritizing sustainability in healthcare? So it really shocked me to find out that the NHS produces 5% of the UK's carbon emissions. So that's an absolutely massive proportion of our greenhouse gases, which are as a consequence of the NHS resources, whether that's going to appointments, whether that's actually medications, whether that's the imaging and the tests that we use, um, or even things like the IT systems use an enormous amount of energy. We know when we're working in healthcare 
that we're just going through single use equipment like there's no tomorrow and it can be really distressing when you think mm, I this isn't sitting right with me this isn't what I signed up for I want to be helping patients but I know the cost that this can have on other people if I continue to be unsustainable in the way that we often have been in hospitals. Medication manufacturing and distribution and packaging has a huge carbon imprint. So what I love about general practice, I get to take people off medications and I absolutely love it. It makes me feel really, really happy knowing that I'm reducing the number of medications, knowing that I'm maybe switching to more sustainable medications or that if I'm taking patients off medications altogether, we can think about things like diet, lifestyle, exercise, sleep, all of these fundamental things which we should be focusing on to try and get patients off medications. The NHS is committed to carbon net zero by 20, I think it's 2050, but this seems like a long way off considering how disposable our culture in the NHS is in order to protect the patients in front of us in terms of things like infection control and the investigations and the medications and the tests that they need. You think about the health implications of climate change and actually this affects all of us and this should be a primary concern of healthcare professionals because we know that yes we can improve the life of the patient in front of us but actually if we look after the environment and we improve sustainability we could be looking after everybody in the world rather just than just the patient who we're treating. So we really need to be think about thinking about this as a matter of public health. What I find really difficult is knowing that I'm trying to go into conservation and knowing that I want to be looking after the environment. Yeah, I still have to use single use gloves and scissors and all of these things that are very, very wasteful. So I find that really difficult working in the NHS and I found it really, really nice not being in hospitals because in general practice you have less things to use and so you're much more careful about what you're using things are much less acute so in A&E the last thing that you're thinking about when a patient is bleeding in front of you or having a stroke is the equipment that you're using but actually in general practice it's really easy to think about these things and general practice aim to get their budget down. So actually with doing carbon savings and with doing cost savings, then this is a great way that we can start thinking about sustainability in healthcare. So coming back to the four pillars in medical ethics, if we're healthcare professionals, if anybody's healthcare professional, you will know about autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence and justice, which essentially means do no harm. We should be looking after the patients that are in front of us and we should be they should be our primary cause for concern however we're becoming much more connected and we're realizing the implications of what our actions have on other people down the line and on the environment so surely these four pillars should extend to the world and the environment and to animals as a whole we should be treating everybody as our patients not just the person that's directly in front of us so i think we really need to extend our our, our perception of what doing no harm means um, and then we should be extending it to the environment as well. Can I just ask everybody to mute their microphones? I've got some feedback. Thank you so much. So this is really interesting and I really love slides like this because it makes me feel really empowered to tell people about what the effects of climate change has on individual human health because I think people don't often think about this people think about climate change as something that affects a community really far away maybe in the Pacific Islands that might be flooding or it might be a community that's affected by drought somewhere really far away but I think one way to motivate change is to try and tell people about the immediate implications that climate change can have on your human health as an individual so that could be things like respiratory diseases we know that we've had the first few deaths related and attributed legally to climate change and that's been in london so we also know that we've got weather changes air pollution um transmission of mosquitoes we know that we're going to have things like malaria that are becoming um more endemic to places that have never seen it before we know that water quality impacts so many people on a psychological and physical level we know that food scarcity and food security affects people. And that's not just down the line. That's not just in developing countries. That's also with us. I don't know if anybody remembers where we had the signs in the supermarkets last year that said, 
we don't have tomatoes and we don't have cucumbers. And that was because of changes in, attributed to changes in the climate that's affecting us directly in supermarkets in the UK. Um, and there's also the fact that lots of people are going to be forced to migrate and we're going to have to deal with the consequence of forced migration and refugees in a safe and secure way. So I think that when we when we highlight to people that actually this is not something that's so far removed from us, and these are the things that it really can affect you and me, then people might be more motivated to, to start thinking about climate change and about what we can do as individuals to reduce our burden on the environment when we're working in healthcare. So think about what your passions are, because we can't do everything. You know, we've got so many speakers here which are doing amazing things, or so many people that are listening that are doing absolutely incredible things. So think about what your passions are. What do you care about? Is it the ocean, like me? Um, is it animals? Is it people? Is it displaced people, like refugees? You know, what do you care about? Is it children? Um, what What is your passion? Think about where you're going to fit in to this chain in healthcare or as an individual to work out where you can focus your time and your energy because you can't do it everywhere. There's, uh, there's some really, really good slides that show how the NHS plans to get to net zero. And I've just put a couple of these in because I think these break it down into really easy places that you can fit in your drives and your passions to try and initiate change within your organization. And it doesn't have to be big, it can just be on your ward. And then you can step that up, it could just be in your GP practice. And then you can step that up, up and then speak to the hospitals and see if you want to implement something. So that's really, really exciting because there's lots of different pathways here that you can get involved in sustainability within hospitals. And I thought this was just a really clear slide as well. So you can choose, do you care about medicine waste? Do you care about uh, buildings and infrastructure? Do you care about uh, communications and networking within the workforce? Do you care about education? Do you care about travel and transport? Maybe, you know, trying to encourage people to cycle to work. Do you care about food, um, which is my area of interest? And that's something that's linked up really nicely with plant-based health professionals and eco-medics. So these are some of the quality improvement projects that Ecomedics has produced, and you can just go onto their quality improvement bank um, and it's available online. And there's about six here, which have some really good ideas about how you can start sustainability projects in hospitals. So they've got inhalers, because we know the burden of inhalers now, so switching to different inhalers can make a massive saving, especially in general practice. Coffee cups, so that's a huge one. So we're trialing that in our hospital now with using reusable containers rather than giving single use um, items for food. Shutting down theater lights with things like dimmer switches is really brilliant. Using reusable scrub hats and, and, and reusable things that otherwise would be thrown. And also the one that I initiated and that was the first, I think, quality improvement project, which was the plant-based canteen. And that was what I did in Maidstone Tunbridge Wells Hospitals to try and encourage them to switch to more sustainable, healthier and delicious diet. So this is a really great website as well. And that has a little bit more extensive uh, suggestions as to what you can do in terms of quality improvement projects or just really easy things. For example, um, writing to your reps about climate education. So this doesn't have to be university. This could be in hospitals or in, or in your healthcare practices as well looking up your institution's carbon targets and trying to figure out where you can reduce them. So there's some really, really good options here. This is just a snapshot of a few of the ones that you can find out more about on students organizing for sustainability. So how can we motivate sustainable change? Again, we've got to pick something and just go for it. These things take time. You have to be really ready to effectively communicate again and again and again and again with your sustainability coordinators and the members of the green plans from your hospitals. You've got to think about what your short-term goal is. Is it having, for example, what we're doing soon, which is a plant-based day in the hospital? Then your medium goals, is this going to be something like trying to have meatless Mondays? Or is this your long-term goals, which for me is going to be switching to completely plant-based diets as lots and lots of different hospitals uh, cities and um, universities and institutions have signed up to, for example, with the plant-based treaty. 
we've got to break these down because often, you know, I can't go straight in there saying we've got to completely just reduce our carbon emissions. We've got to switch to, to completely vegan diets. We've got to break this down and think about what's going to be step one and how are you going to communicate that with the people that it's important to communicate with. So, for example, in my case, I went straight to the hospital's catering and procurement services um, and I've been kind of just harassing them for the last three, four years. And we're slowly but surely getting there, but it takes time and you've got to give them really, really specific things that they can act on. They, people also are smart. People need evidence. You know, if you look at the sustainability leads and the green plan leads, they need numbers. So if you can start collecting numbers and start collecting facts, then this is absolutely brilliant. And you should be able to build up more of that evidence to try and convince other institutions to follow suit. And persistent, don't give up. If you believe in something, then just keep on with it. Because this took me three or four years and I really, really was close to giving up on the hospital. I actually moved away um, and started in general practice and then was focusing my interests and my, my efforts on other areas. And then I, I took a bit of time out because I was feeling a bit burnt out with the hospital. And um, eventually I got back in touch with them and they've allowed me to do a fully plant-based day in Maidstone and Tunbridge Wells hospitals. Um, so this is such a big step, but it's taken years and years of persistence. And these were some of the meals which were given out for free to the staff during COVID and they were all vegan. And I was so proud of this, but it took time. So don't give up. If you believe that something is really, really beneficial to your patients, to the environment, to your colleagues, and to, to in, individual and environmental health, then just be persistent. Know when to take a break and know when to, to go easy on yourself, but don't give up because these things often do take time to push for. And sometimes you might need to go to, to, to just find a completely different route and to try it a different way, but definitely don't give up. If you believe that something is right and you believe that you're doing the right thing, then, then just go for your project and somebody will start to listen and then you'll get momentum and you get, you'll get the ball rolling. So two events, which I'm really excited about that we've got coming up with Ecomedics. One of them is the upcoming sharing circle. So it's our third one on February the 7th. I think that's on Wednesday and that's at Love Shack in London. Uh, so we've got a really nice group. We always have a really, really good chat and social afterwards. And it's really great networking. We have some really, really good facilitated discussions about how to manage eco-anxiety and environmental issues in the workplace. And then the last weekend of May, coming up to the first weekend of June, we've got the first Ecomedics retreat. So we've got some amazing speakers. We've got an amazing campsite in Essex booked out. We'll be doing some paddle boarding, some workshops about sustainability, um, some talks about diet, some yoga sessions, sharing circles again. Um, there'll be a kind of variety um, open mic night. So that should be lovely. And we've got some amazing musicians coming up as well. So definitely get involved. Just follow Ecomedics on Instagram or Facebook. Or you can just find the website as well. Uh, but check Ecomedics out. If you're a healthcare worker, if you know anybody that's concerned and feels like they're quite isolated in this, then definitely just connect us because we're an amazing organization to be part of. And we really, really want to help people with this. So thank you so much. I will stop sharing my screen now and I will take it over to... Do, do, do. Steve, is Steve here uh, from Sussex Seabird Restoration Project? Do we have yeah. Steve on? Hi. Yeah, how's it going? You all right? Absolutely great. How are you? I'm all good. I thought um, I'd join you in after the last year of your fundraising for the project. So thank you so much for like everyone that actually put some money towards the project. And it's only... As always, get, gathers more and more momentum with the BBC, ITV and Channel 4 and all the rest of it. So, um, and soon to go on Country Files. So, yeah. So, it's been it's been interesting listening to what you were just saying about that eco uh, campsite in end of May, early June. What's the numbers that you've got so far going to it? 40, I'm hoping for. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that so it should be good. You're more than welcome to come along. And what's the location of that? It's where just an it? ethic. So it's called Sparrow's okay. Campsite. It's where we normally have our yoga retreat. You will love it. It's so lovely. You can do a session. <laughs> I'm not very bendy any longer. I need to work on that. <laughs> well, I didn't mean a yoga. You can do a yoga session, but you can host a session talking about your work. We would love that. Yeah. 
yeah, it'd be um, yeah, it'd be good. And um, and also, I was like listening to that five percent of NHS um, stuff affects carbon and all the rest of it. So yeah, I, I work in the NHS. So it's amazing that you think we're working in a good place, and there we are, you know, not doing the correct stuff with um, sustainability and that sort of stuff so yeah yeah the, yeah the nhs is really really proactive and working towards it so every conversation that i've had with them and every meeting that i've had with them has been really really insightful and they're re there's amazing people doing amazing work but we're such a big organization and obviously you've got to prioritize the patient in front of you um so it can be really difficult and i find that quite emotionally conflicting in my workplace which is why I chose general practice to try and reduce the resources. And I'm really happy with that. So it's about working with what we've got. But yes, I introduced you as a man of many talents, also working now again as an NHS physio and teaching medical students, which I said you're having fun with. Yeah, they're good laugh. And yeah, uh, yeah it's all good. And, um, and it's progressed a lot since the last time I spoke to you. So if I did a recap from, when did we do it? February last year? Yeah, I think it was about February, March last year. So it's about a year. So if I do a bit of a recap, so basically since then I've planted about 400, 600 plants out in the Sussex seabed. Um, I've worked more now with some of the universities in marine science um, at Sussex University with Marianne Glascott. And if you just type in Sussex Kelp Channel 4, anyone's listening and wants to kind of sit down and have a coffee after, just type in... Um, yeah, Sussex Kelp, um, Channel 4. And it's about a six-minute sort of really good documentation about what happened since the 1980s on the Sussex uh, seabed and how much kelp we've lost and how much biodiversity. And it's funny that that farmer previously to this was talking about the fact that for grazing sheep, you just assume sheep grass and that's the biodiversity where the, the seabed's the same. You used to have so many different marine species and so many different plant life, but because we've humanly affected the whole seabed, just like farming and landscaping, all you've got now is a barren seabed. So I'm always interested, like farming angle, of yeah, let it rewild itself. If it doesn't, clearly it doesn't really work. We've been watching that Sussex seabed for 30 years. You've got to kind of intervene and put a little bit of plant life back to kind of encourage marine life and biodiversity to come back, just like seagrass meadows and that sort of stuff. So yeah, so so since the last week, you, I've done Channel 4, done ITV, uh, wow. been in the newspaper quite a few times, went out to Europe to do a talk in uh, Europe um and then spoke to country file a bit over the last couple of weeks wow. and they want to do two um episodes of the project oh all from my garage <laughs> so it's amazing when you're saying about don't give up yeah you hit times and you think god i can't be really bothered with this any longer and i'd rather just go for a run along the beach but yeah. the pro problem is you're passionate and you can't give up because the next morning you wake up you think to yourself Oh yeah, that's burning in my head again. I've yeah. crack on with the project. So yeah, it's just you're addicted, it, it, Steve. I can tell. It's a nightmare. <laughs> if I could find a new hobby. <laughs> Go, you come on, you're doing this one so well. But you, but you can't. So you just have to carry the torch and carry it on. But um, yeah, but also like you said just don't burn out make sure you just do it in, uh, at the pace you want to go at because that's important as well because I see um, you having fun too which makes me oh, really yeah. happy because oh, I yeah. have a lot of fun you, you see you, me having fun you know I see all of yeah, these you've got, of it. You've got to blend it to, you've got to blend it together like even that's just booking a holiday or buying a new bike whatever it might be just to cut or do some gardening or whatever it is yeah you've got to you've got to get that balance right because if it was just intensely like that when you're trying to lead something you can't you can't you can't sustain it it's not it's not sustainable so you've just got to balance up but anyway let me go and show you the kelp hub yes uh so if i put that on over here so i'm in my um very this is my new wallpaper I don't oh know it's if you lovely like it. life's a beach you can buy on amazon it's really That's cheap so funny <laughs> So um, anyway, so yeah, there we go, and there we go. But I just want a bit of colour in here. Oh, and, definitely. Um, oh, it looks so nice. I can't wait to I'm see always, the setup. 
yeah, I'm off um, Wi-Fi, so sh shouldn't kind of clock out. But you might say, okay, it looks the same as it did last time. But if you look at the bottom uh, down here on each set of uh, kelp pubs, there's a dog as well. Yeah. You've got um, two different sumps, and in those sumps are protein skimmers, and there's a UV light there, which is very powerful, sort of ozone UV light. And what that does is every time the water pours through the tanks, it goes back down to the sump. And one of the things I found with kelp restoration is the, is the clarity of water. You want it to be so clean and fresh with the salinity at the right, temp uh, salinity at the right level, the pH, and the water temperature at the right uh, temperature. If you get the pH, the salinity, and the temperatures right, then you can start understanding the actual spores as they land onto the rocks. You need a certain, you need to get all those free right for the germination of kelp plants. So if I zoom in here, you'll probably, this is probably what country file will zoom into. But like for that particular rock, it's got really good density of, of kelp or sporophytes. And, and like that's the temperature there. So the temperature's set around 10 degrees. And it's the same on all these individual rocks. I just put them in there just to kind of um, show you what's possible when the BBC comes filming here. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I did this year is I wanted to create a carpet. So, oh. Are you still there? Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, I just thought we lost connection there. The no, other no, thing I want to do is to create a kelp carpet. So in here is sheet wool and it's been knitted together. Mm. And I have to get some steel pushes if you want to put it up after. But in there is hundreds of, of kelp bars. I might be able to film it from the side. I need a GoPro at this point, but basically this is another idea to kind of staple the, the sheet wall onto the seabed on a muscle bed. So eventually the actual kelps bind back into the muscles and then hopefully it will encourage oysters and other bits of biodiversity to come along. Wow. Another one I'm doing is growing it on sheet wall and you can see that I don't know if the light's any good. Probably yeah, better if I could put the plants back in there. But it's again, it's growing it onto a onto a substrate. Yeah. Which is biodegradable. So you can put these things in the sea. There's zero plastic. Wow. And when there's zero plastic, it, it's not going to harm the sea. It's not going to harm the plants. And you can staple them straight onto the seabed. Yeah. And and encourage the, the marine life to come back. And I filmed some of that from last year. And it's the same with some of the plants on the surface there. Wow. They're already happy and growing away. And it's just the fact that it's so important to kind of start this process. A lot of universities in that, they don't study this sort of stuff. They don't get involved as much into the actual nursery side of, of marine biodiversity and kelp yeah. restoration. You said you've got some students coming now to take some of the spores yeah. and see what's happening to, to do some experiments with them, right? Yeah, so the students are coming along and they're always saying the same thing. We don't learn any of this stuff at universities. Yeah. Oh, there we go. If I wipe this out there, you can see uh, you can see the, the kelp carpets that I've been making. So you wow. can see all the plants. They're really growing. Yeah. Yeah. The, the people say you've got a bit of a magic touch because You do, you've got green fingers. When are you gonna put them back then? When are you gonna put them in? Um I don't know, well, I'm gonna work with the universities so, so they can then study these plants underwater and write the right papers that are needed. Yeah. Let me just ping that round. I don't know why that's the brown like that. I just hold it like that. Is that Yeah, down? it's absolutely great. And then on this side here. I'm growing on the different uh, lux and piles of lighting again from the crowdfunder. So you can actually see the plants growing out the, the pipes. What? Um, this, they, this, they is like... what our, this is what our donations paid for? Yeah. Oh, no so, way! So your donations went to all the equipment needed to, to basically get the, the cow restoration project to the next level. I'm it so roughly happy. Cost about, so up here, it roughly costs about two... 
8,500 to get the right power of lighting and to also get the right movement of water coming through because basically what you want, I don't know why my camera keeps going around that, but what you want is um, is the, the entire thing to be running so you've got lots of circulation, right. lots of oxygen, and in fact, I was talking to you the other day, I don't know why my phone's going around that way, but I'm now having to use CO2 boosters because the plants are producing so much oxygen in here that I've got to counteract the oxygen Good. and put more CO2 into it. So it's showing that in this environment already the pH levels are rising and you've got to add more and more uh, carbon okay. into, into the water because the plants are doing what they should be doing. And That's per crazy. one hectare of an Amazon rainforest, a kelp forest can offset the same amount of carbon six times quicker. Wow. So and we really already... underestimate the power of the kelp forests and the seabed. Yeah, so it's already showing in this in these tanks from your crowdfunding that you're developing a pioneering project, which probably no one's really ever done in the UK. So No, you look like a mad scientist. You seem like a crazy yeah. scientist, and it's brilliant. I, I, seem, I seem to be going like that, don't I? But I'm <laughs> hoping to. Uh, I'm hoping to. Wait a minute. I'm hoping to uh, to uh, just get that information across to the right people. Yeah. And then those right people can then take this formula forwards and go right. If we want to restore our oceans, yeah. Maybe all this stuff that Steve's been doing in his garage has got the right methodology to take that forwards and then become a project for uh, sustainability with kelp restoration. So, Definitely. and next, no, was it the 29th of uh, February? I'm meant to be meeting up with the Crown Estate to talk about this. So that'll be cool. Um, see what happens there. Amazing. You've got to let us know. I've got to switch over to Billy now at the retreat, but I will speak to you. Yeah about coming to the to the um, Ecomedics retreat, but also if you could host a workshop about what you're doing, that would be absolutely amazing. But get involved. <laughs> I think you're probably more bendy than you think. We'll get you there. We've got three days to do it. Okay. Yeah, cool. Well, honestly, it's been a pleasure. And thanks so much for the money because it all helps out. So no, it's thank you for what you're doing. A, I'm so story, amazed so, yeah. by it, inspired, and it's, it's, it's incredible. So it's nice to cool. speak to you, Steve. No worries. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. Oh, I just love seeing Steve's work. If you can, then please follow his work on the Sussex Seabed Restoration Facebook page. Um, he does post regular videos and people do put videos of the biodiversity. And it's just absolutely amazing to see something that is so close, um, so local, and that is just being so effective in conserving the kelp forests, which, as we, as we said, is so important for biodiversity. So do I have lovely Billy from the Retreat Animal Sanctuary here? Well, hi, please. Can you see me? No, I can't see you. I can see Billy's iPhone. Oh, right. <laughs> Try and switch your video on. If not, we'll have a nice chat. Right. No, I've got it. Look, you're a great teacher. Look, there we are. <laughs> um, one minute. It just I just saw the icon for it. Perfect. Here we go. I, I'd love to see your face. Oh, yes. Hello. Look at that. And what I was just listening to that interview. Isn't that inspiring? Absolutely, you know, incredible what people are doing, individuals are doing. So yeah, it's amazing. I love this conference because it means I get to chat to my friends about what we're all doing. And it's just the most exciting thing. So I, you know, I love the retreat. It feels like the safest space in the world. Um, so yeah, I'm so, so excited to hear about what you've been doing. You can tell us all about the retreat um, and about how we can get involved as well. Well, so for people who, who, who don't know, I'm, I'm Billy and um, I've been at the helm of the retreat since it began. It's kind of morphed into a few other projects as well. So now there's two offshoots. There's um, Earth Dragons International Dog Sanctuary, saving uh, street dogs from across the world dogs who have no hope so not dogs that you could just take and give to people and also we since 97 we've run a, a travelers project um supporting travelers animals so which is called the flare foundation so that's it in a nutshell really 
I'm also trustee of a brilliant cat sanctuary called Catastrophes Cat Sanctuary in, in Sussex, which is home to about 200 cats. So busy, busy time, um, along with career and family and, and the retreat. So yeah. at the retreat, should I just should I just tell everyone in a nutshell what the retreat does? Oh, don't have to do it in a nutshell. We've got time. You can tell us all about the retreat. Okay. Well, the retreat is my baby. So it started, it was it was never meant to be what it is. You know, I've always loved animals. I just I just wanted to help animals. So there's been a very organic growth. I mean, I didn't even name the centre, didn't even come up with an idea of a centre. It was just home for me and a lot of rescued animals. And it's just morphed into its own machine now saving you know every day there's um weird there's an admission of of um of a little creature every single day so it's really like it's um i'm extremely proud of it and um that's not ego talking i, I mean i'm proud of the people behind it i'm proud of the team who uh, the caregivers give those animals everything they're the, the kind of individual needs that that they need every day so yeah so it's farm animal sanctuary horse sanctuary domestic um sanctuary disabled wildlife uh, british wildlife sanctuary and a few exotics they're not really our thing so they arrive on site and then we we kind of get them to the place they should be it's so um did start how did, how on earth did this start when did you start this because it's so beautiful now for anybody that hasn't visited yeah well i mean now people come and obviously there's a vegan cafe there's a vegan mini market there's a um, vegan charity shop yeah charity shop vegan merch shop and there's two holiday lodges there's um an on-site registered veterinary practice now there's a wildlife hospital so really none of this was ever my intention my intention was just to love animals and uh, and help and i mean i haven't achieved this on my own i've achieved this with a huge amount. I mean, the team is very, very strong at the retreat. The people are so dedicated, whether they're paid or volunteers. They're, they're, the retreat is in their DNA. Helping animals is in their DNA. So I'm very lucky. I've got a very supportive family. All my family's involved. Um, so pretty much if they're not already vegan, they're vegetarian. And uh, they, they, they go out night and day to help animals and support us in fundraising and volunteering. So I'm very, very lucky. And really, it just, it went from me having a lot of animals at home that I was rescuing from all over the world from when I've travelled, from having all these little, little dogs looking at me whilst I talk to you. <laughs> They're going, <laughs> talking about else, Dad? Um, <laughs> and, and it's just grown, really. And then from that, it, it, one day its name arrived. Uh, people were always saying it's animal rescue, but then the retreat arrived about 27 years ago the name and then from then it was a case of you never had to look for another animal again they came to you yes so that it, it's all by mistake I can't take any credit for it really so you must be a Dr Doolittle because it's the funniest place I think the first time I came there was a rat playing with a cat that was playing with a turkey and they were all just hanging out and it's just the most peaceful environment that's kind of the beauty of the place, isn't it? Everything, inclu including the human visitors, yeah. everyone interacting with everyone. And, and I think they're the days when when I've got a little bit of time and I'm on site and I, and I think, oh, this is a real this is a real privilege, you know, not just to live alongside those saved animals who are all telling an amazing survivor's story. You know, they're all they're all. Um, they're all unique, but they're all speaking for a trillion other creatures that haven't been so lucky. So not only that, then I get my amazing team, which um, every single one of them, from the people that clean the toilets to the people that run the rescue, um, that go out and rescue, the team is incredible. And that's a real privilege to have those people around you. And then, like you, the next privilege, I get to meet the most incredible people that come through the gate of my home and tell me what they are doing to help animals. And th that for me, probably every day we are open to the um, to the public. That That's overwhelming for me because you you just you see incredibly beautiful stories of what people are achieving every day for animals. And lots of couples have met at the retreat, haven't they? I speak oh, to more and more people and then I met at the retreat and it's just so lovely. You're creating homes for so many people and things. You're right. At, at one stage, just on the team alone, we had 10 couples that had all met at the oh. retreat. 
and then it spills out to visitors. We're talking but, about human couples. <laughs> yeah, human couples. There's probably, <laughs> probably thousands of animal couples. Yes. Human couples. At one time on the team, there was 10 couples. That's so and, funny. Incredible. Is um, a young woman had her first date at the retreat. Her, then she started dating him. He then proposed to her at the retreat. They're called Indigo and Roberto. And then wait for this. They had their wedding at the retreat. Oh my gosh. How magical it, must that have been? It, 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 was, it, was beyond, it was beyond anything I've ever experienced. It was such a beautiful wedding. They had about a hundred people sit down meal in beautiful marquees and everything animal themed. Yeah. Oh, so, I can't imagine a more perfect place. So tell me about the wildlife vet then. Are they just on standby? I didn't realise you had a vet there. Yeah, so we, we've got we've got two things happening at the retreat. So we've got a wildlife hospital. So that's pretty much where wildlife arrives. And we've got an intensive care unit and an acute medical unit. We've also got an end of life unit because obviously so many animals, wildlife, get hit by cars and, and sadly there's no fixing them. So we've got a really dignified end of life unit. And then we've got a separate on-site veterinary practice, which is really just for neutering. But what has happened, so any charities out there, we need to free of charge for any charities so they can come to the retreat. Uh, no one's means tested. If you've got animals you want neutered and you're a charity, we will do it for you. Wow. What's happened through the neuter project is that we had the most incredible vets actually given their time free of charge, the most incredible nurses given their time free of charge, but they all bring a little bit of extra expertise so now we've even got a really brilliant vet who's called Hillary, who really deserves a shout out. Mm -hmm. who's a, who, who's, there's nothing she doesn't know about avians. So she is, um, she's the bird vet. And um, yes, yeah, so for having that little opportunity, it's really helped the chickens. Yeah, what a brilliant network of people you've created. So I wasn't planning on asking you this, but if I come, when I come back from my conservation projects, if I come back from the summer, please could I come and shadow? The, the the vets. I don't know anything about animal medicine. I know too much about humans and not anything about animals. Uh, absolutely. I, I would love to. It's probably a bit more complex, actually, animals, isn't it? Because there's so many different little, um, like, subcultures, like birds, for in, you know, for instance. They're just so different to anything else, aren't they? Yeah, so, it's so varied. And they can't communicate with you the way that humans can. So I feel like we come from a position of privilege. I've always said vets and paramedics, I think, are just the angels of this world, especially if they're vegan. Uh, yeah. But you'd absolutely love to do that. So what do you got? What have you got coming up then? Well, we've got quite an exciting year, actually, if I'm honest, at the retreat. So we've had a rebuild um, for the visitors. So there's a new shop, a much, much bigger supermarket. There's a new venue area, so that for, we do a lot of inspirational kind of talks and activist days. So they've got an, they've got a new center, like a like a big walk, and it'd be able to have screens on the wall and wow. stuff. We'd be able to have art exhibitions and stuff in there. So mm -hmm. that's happening. The new shops are happening. The most magical thing is our fundraising has paid off, and we actually have enough in the in the pot to buy the farm next door now so no. yeah so oh this this will all roll forward this year and we will double in size physically double in size wow. this, this is really good for us because not only is it more physical space for those really busy times like baby season and the winter but it would be more venue space and also a huge saving to the center because we will be able to grow our own hay, which wow. will just our hay, the saving of the hay will be about 25K a year. Wow, um, that um, much? Yeah, and that's just hay. That's I not- I don't know anything about growing hay. Does it just grow out like of the ground like grass? What is it? Well, it is just grass, really. Hay okay. is just, I mean, there's some management to it and stuff. Okay. And, of, and it's very weather dependent. So it's right. kind of like, We'll be out there with our little umbrellas over it. Yeah, umbrella. don't get waterlogged. Yeah, so that's really, really exciting for us because it will it will provide a whole yeah, a, a, a whole new avenue of things to do um, to help animals. And then, I'm not sure if you know about this, but in 2021, I wrote my first book. Earth Boy. 
Yes. I well, do. That, that's incredible. Well, since I've written five books. Five. And, um, yeah, the, the second one comes out on the 16th of this month. I'm kind of staggering them for people because they're going to be sick to death of me otherwise, aren't they? Oh, I so, don't think so. But also, how have you found the time to write five or six books now? Yeah, no, five, five including her. Okay, yeah. okay, still, still. How how have you managed that? Do you love to write? Yeah, I do. And I think for me, I've never been able to meditate. I've, I've been very interested in meditation and, and finding those those quiet spaces for yourself and stuff. And um, because also I'm night manager seven nights a week and I have paid work and and then I have my dogs that live with me. I have a house who, who demands some time. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. I've, got, I've got to that point where I really, really think that re um, writing especially is my time. You know, like if I'm reading a book, then if the dogs bark to go out, I kind of like put the book down and go and let the dogs out and we go for a walk. And stuff. But if I'm writing, I'm quite, um, I'm quite structured in the fact that I'm going to, I'm like, I'm going to write for four hours this afternoon. So yeah. So dogs have to sleep around me and. Uh, oh, but you can tell you're very, you're one, very, very good at what you do and it gets done very effectively, but two, that you also put so much love into it. You're right. You've got to enjoy it and you've got to wake up every morning with that that kind of. And this is really important, I think, in the vegan animal world that you, you've you got to look after yourself. You really have. And that's mentally as well as, well as physically. And um, yeah, like well, you know, my my workshops, at the retreat are always about activist mental health. So actually, last time it just started raining really heavily and Mobius Loop were just there. They had their lovely stage. And they said to everybody, I'll oh, get on the stage, but there was a lovely marquee and everybody just moved into just to, to be sheltered from the rain. And we did a two minute, three minute meditation that I'd written for Animal Rising. And it was so powerful. And I really think we do need to look after ourselves and each other. And the retreat really helps with that. Yeah, I, I think actually um, animal sanctuaries are not just because I'm involved in one, but I think it's like the lost resource because there's more animal sanctuaries than we think. But actually, most of them have their doors closed, you know, because for good reasons, they've got a lot of work to do and whatever. But actually, it's like this this forgotten resource, because not only does it, it give you a little bit of time to breathe easy because you're in a safe space, but it gives you hope, you know, because you'll meet like minded people. You'll think that the world is not like your office that you go off to in mainstream. Where you could be the only one who cares about anything yeah. you you up at a vegan animal uh, animal sanctuary and everybody in the cafe area is eating plant-based foods because they want to you know not, not because they have to because they want to uh, it's, it's such a magical experience and in uh, long before I had the retreat I was going to those places and I think it's one of the reasons I've never had burnout you know my, my days can be 23 and a half hour long I can be doing the most appalling things not just unblocking visitors toilets but picking <laughs> baguettes off of um, little creature yeah. but yeah. when I eventually go, go to bed I will always wake up the next day um, full, full of, of plant-based power and, and fuel and uh, but which pushes you to go on to do you know lead another day it's, it's so important to look after yourself it's you yeah. know it's yeah and what are your and tips for activists that might feel like they're struggling with knowing that many other people don't care about the things that we care about, what would your tips be for somebody that might be struggling with burnout? Well, something I heard a long, long time ago, which had nothing to do with animals, but it was a great lesson for me. I was, a, it was like one of the major disasters across the world and they were interviewing an aid worker and they said, how do you cope with this? And this is very simple, but it's a, it's a great lesson. And that aid worker, and it's always stayed with me, they said, we bury the dead and we look after the living. And that's because that's all you can do. It's no good. It's no good. You go into bed of a night, your mind filled with stuff that is, that is crippling and essentially killing you um, with stuff you cannot do so, anything about. But by being in an analysis, you can actually, you're, you're lead by incredible example everybody it doesn't it doesn't matter if you know your facts or you don't know your facts you will all have an audience that is interested in listening to you look at me I'm such a talker I could talk for hours but you're everybody will have an audience 
of people that will listen to them and this is so this is so important so really kind of do oh have we gone okay. have we gone are you still there no no no, no we're still here we're still here oh, wait, i thought <laughs> you did um i just think it's so important that we we kind of you know, we all micromanage our life and we, we you break our problems down into tiny boxes and stuff. And then we we deal with those things we can deal with. But there are things you can't deal with. And you are better off being a, a physically and mentally well activist and doing the things, even if you think they're tiny little things, you know, but it, it will be that's that's how I've always seen it. And, you know, in, invest in those things, invest in even when your family you know, my family at first were not vegans and, and cared very little, but I invested my time and my energy into the people I loved and I knew were good people. They just ne they just needed a little bit of encouragement and um, and it's all it's all paid off. I'm surrounded by incredible people. I know this will sound a bit odd, but I've only ever been loved. And I think that's because I, I bang, bang that vibration of only loving and, and doing my best for people and animals. So. I feel very blessed, but I think that's the most important thing. You do what you can, you know. And what would you say for people? Um, like I don't know if you know, you know, new beginnings and small animal sanctuaries like that. Um, what would you say for people that have this dream and don't really know where to get started, but really care about animals and want to create a safe space? Yeah, so I do know new beginnings, and I love them. And um, yeah, I love I've them too their whole journey and and lots of our beloved residents live with them now so really? um, yeah so it's um it's 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 been an absolute journey and it, it's it's teamwork now absolutely anybody anybody um can save animals you know even if you're using your box room to save rodents or pigeons or um aquatics and then you move up you move up the ladder you don't you know, it's going to be pretty impossible to, for everyone to have a farm like the retreat overnight. Yeah. It's not just can't do it. And there are people like me and Nikki at New Beginnings who will talk to people and support them. Um, last year, I mentored six. Uh, sorry. Last year, I mentored three couples and one single to go forward across the world to open um, um, shelters, rescue centers to help animals and stuff. So it's doable if it's in you, if it really, you know, for everybody, it's not in everybody. They do other things for animals and that's still brilliant. Um, but there's there's massive resources. All you've got to do is just ask. You just come to the center and not as a promotion, but inside Earth Boy, my book, one of the main reasons on the first page i left all my details including my mobile phone number oh that's so kind yeah and even if people didn't like it they can message me and i can say listen the reason you don't like it, you don't like saving animals is because you're misguided and you know just with love and respect um but this is how people have found me because there's my email there's my telephone number there's my address if you wanted to write to me so yeah and um i'm so grateful because they're the people that fuel my furnace they're the people that inspire me because i know there's people coming behind me you know you we're all going to go at some stage and to know that there's people coming up behind helping and saving animals is just the blessing i want to hear oh it must be so um just going back how did this all start where did your interest in animal conservation and welfare begin um You still here? I think we've lost a Billy. We'll give him a minute in case he wants to uh, join back on to answer our last question. But if not, then we'll move on to Daughters of the Deep. Let's give Billy a minute. But yeah, I really, really can't recommend the Animal Sanctuary, the retreat enough. It's just in Ashford. So it's really, really close by. It's really accessible. They've got loads of volunteer days. So just follow them on Facebook or Instagram. You can find out more about volunteering with them. Uh, they have an amazing festival that they normally do. I think this time it should be at the end of August, hopefully. And they've got some brilliant speakers for that. Last year they had Mobius Loop performing. So that was absolutely incredible. But yeah, the retreat is this amazing, amazing safe space. Oh. That's not just for animals, like we've mentioned, it's also for people. 
and it feels like such a peaceful, peaceful environment. Um, it's it's an absolutely brilliant place to be. So definitely I'm go sorry. and check it out. Hi, Billy, are you back? Yeah, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? That's okay. We can hear you. Yeah, do you want to answer um our last question, which is just how did this interest in animal conservation and welfare, how was that sparked? Yeah, and sorry, that was one of my dogs who did yeah. some I'm not going to tell you what they did because it was terribly embarrassing. And there's, there's a very naughty male dog that lives. <laughs> lives. Um, okay, so it, it really all come from that whole thing, from being that child that loved animals. So as, as I grew and whatever else happened in my life, um, I always could see the injustices done to animals. So it, it, whatever and whoever I could save, I saved. So within I think I may have been 14 and I already had brought 11 stray dogs home I'd already brought I think six or seven horse ponies that were going to be killed because they were no longer and my parents had no money and they were infuriated by this so I kind of knew what I was going to do but just not in what capacity I knew I was going to always be the one that would be out there helping an animal but um the retreat was a total surprise to me. So slowly but surely, as my family grew, it would, you'd have to buy a bigger house. <laughs> and then the family would grow there and you'd buy a bigger house. So that's how it came. And my enlightenment, I became a vegan. During, I became a vegetarian at the age of 14 um, because in a cookery class at school, the home economics teacher brought in two dead rabbits and I had pet rabbits at home and I, I couldn't believe that these little animals, their life had been ended for something as, as wasteful as a mouthful of flesh. So I went home a vegetarian, which mortified the family. Late teens became a vegan, which mortified the family even more. And I think one of the things I've learned, and this is not, this is not meant to be condescending to anybody who's on their journey but I look back at my years as a vegetarian and one thing I realize now with a lot of deep thought um you become a vegetarian for yourself but you become a vegan for animals there is this there is this ocean between the two you know more often than not you'll get vegetarians who will tell you why they can't change to vegan and it's no different to the the reasons why the meat eaters are saying they can't change to vegetarianism and it is it, it's it, if we could just get people to look at it from those victims point of view the vegan um, the the move from either meat eating or vegetarian vegan is i think is a lot easier once you see it from the point of view of animals not from the point that you think you're an animal lover so you become a vegetarian so really as soon as i was vegan my eyes were open i become an i active... always tell people about i think i've mentioned it on the bbc um i think i mentioned it in parliament it definitely goes into a lot of my writing that the first thing that you see when you walk into the retreat is if slaughterhouses glass if slaughterhouses had glass walls then we'd all be vegan and I love that I think that's such a perfect because it says it in such a simple way but it's still such a beautiful slogan to have as soon as you walk in um, yeah. and I always tell that to people and I always recommend for people to come and just check out the retreat as well so I'm really yeah. really blessed to have been part of um, some of the memories that we've made there and I can't wait for more. Thank, thank you so much for being so kind about the retreat. I mean, that's really what I hope the impact it has on everybody. And, you know, I've seen it with my own eyes. I've seen people come to the, come to the centre who are um, who eat animals, who are farmers, and then they change because of um, what they see. So I'm terribly grateful. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for everything that you're doing. And I'll speak to you soon. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Have a lovely afternoon. And what Bye, a great... Billy, you too. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Oh, guys, I couldn't recommend the retreat more. It's such a lovely place, even if you just go for lunch and just pop down or you can even muck out. You know, loads of my friends have been to volunteer. Um, I haven't been yet to get my hands dirty, but I have done some talks and workshops and things there. And it's such a it's such a blessing to be part of it. So have we got George here from Daughters of the Deep? I think we might do. Hello. Some... Hello. How are you? Yeah, thank you. How are yourself? Absolutely great. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining today. I am so excited to hear about your work. No problem, not at all. Um, have you got the slides up? Are you going to share those, or is it? Do you want you, me to? Can you screen share? Can you screen share? I've got the yeah, settings yeah. on here. Perfect. Just make no, it easier no so you know when to click. Um, you're going to give me two seconds. Absolutely there. fine. Talk amongst yourselves. 
Mm. Oh, thank you to everybody that's come to support this today. I know it's a Saturday and it's probably only people like me that want to do lots of learning on Saturdays, but you guys have all come to support. So thank you. Between this and between my dad's fundraiser, I think we've got about 600, 700 pounds for the next well. So that's about 1,500 pounds in total. Um, so not long now until we can donate the third well for clean water for a village in India. Cool, so I shared the screen. Can everyone see that? Yeah. Hopefully. Um, I've just got this participants bit up. So um, yeah, thank you for inviting us today. So um, I'm speaking on behalf of Daughters of the Deep, um, a charity that is uh, Australian based. Um, we've been a charity running for about uh, two, three years now. And um, we're also registered in the um, in the European Union, uh, based out of Spain. And we're also just uh, at the moment coming to the UK. So kind of perfect timing to, to talk to a UK audience. Um, we registered now as a CIC, and we're sort of going to continue to start to do some of our work there. So um, as you can kind of see from our logo, we're kind of um, um, sort of based around this kind of image of sort of hardness of, of people working in and around the ocean. You know, this kind of biker gang club mentality we wanted to create um, through this imagery so that people could be kind of like drawn into what it is and want to understand a little bit more about um, what work we're doing. So we're kind of based in and around all industries working with the oceans and they're kind of hopefully you'll start to see um, this, this sort of badge pinned up around some of those um, institutions. So doors of the deep then. What are we? So um, our mission is to provide women with vocational training and educations and essentially the opportunities to pursue maritime and marine sciences. So um, the the kind of um, inequality that was uh, seen by a lot of our founding members was that um, in many um, attributes or in many centers of, of marine work, uh, it was highly male dominated. Um, kind of something, again, I saw through my life working in scuba diving, um, that it was always kind of, um, for want of a better phrase, a boys club. Um, and, it, and it really was, and it kind of started to change. But um, in many parts of the world that I was working, things weren't changing at all. And in reality, and the gaps seemed to be getting larger. So what Daughters of Deep was kind of um, setting out to do was essentially equalize these oceans. That's kind of our little catchphrase. Um, so that we could offer the opportunity for more women to across the grove, uh, across the globe, sorry, to find the confidence and also the financial and social opportunities to try diving, master sciences, you know, conquer waves, captain ships, and most importantly, at least to, to my heart, become lead voices in, in the flight to the, the fight to save our seas. Now, essentially, Dorsa Deep was kind of spun out of a, an idea through another charity that I'll that I um, help run, which I'll talk a little bit about um, from requests uh, in the previous meetings. Um, but essentially, we started off trying to understand how we could help more women get into scuba diving and marine sciences. Um, as we sort of developed and started to, to speak to more women in, in different roles within, within ocean um, conservation, we realized that this brand and this exercise could be applied and owned by a multitude of different people and organizations. Um, the idea that we sort of own the brand is not something that we go around saying, but we wanted to create something that people could resonate with and apply to their industries, their enjoyments, their pleasures, whatever, where they felt there was inequality. Um, and the whole idea is that we're kind of a front for, for equalizing this whole ocean space um, so that we can kind of um, address some of the imbalances that we're seeing across you know, a multitude of different uh, facets. So what's kind of the, the issues then? So ocean research, um, it's still quite, um, you know, it, it's, 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 I would say it's, it's, it's closer than some of the industries. Um, we're seeing, you know, women involved in, in more marine science spaces um, than ever. However, as with most sort of um, industries, when you actually look and break down the statistics, um, most of these are sort of lower grade positions, those holding the top grade positions, um, lectureships and other things like this. Again, quite highly male dominated. Um, and so we're trying to kind of address um, that as, a, as an issue, um, mainly because that's some of the work that, that a couple of our founders are, are heavily involved in. Overall research, you can see that drops down a little bit lower. Um, 
When you look at the maritime industry, though, this is where you see some of the most startling um, statistics. You know, only 2% uh, female participation uh, within the overall maritime industries. Now, that's anything essentially um, working on boats and working with the oceans. So again, a really low statistic when we're looking at um, how um, these careers may be offered to women and what the issues might be. Um, cruise lines, so people working in those professional uh, industries, working with sort of like tourism cruises, again, a low percentage uh, of women. Um, the fishing industries is a more balanced affair, uh, however, very much subject to underpay and, and lack of recognition and sort of short term contracts. And um, we are seeing um, more female participation in those areas, but it kind of does take into account some of the, the smaller end work of, of like managing nets and working on the ground. So. Overall, if we look at um, um, the, the issues facing the Maritimes industries, we're seeing um, a lot of inequality. And, and the reality is, is that's what we are, are here to kind of address. And we did so maybe quite naively at the beginning because we started to kind of just focus on that sort of like marine science scuba industry. But then when everything opened up to us, this is where the charity started to evolve a lot further. So... As I kind of mentioned, we um, launched in, in 2021. Um, we're essentially trying to find ways that, to, to essentially allow um, women to access um, um, industries and rights to work, uh, be that through uh, socioeconomic bar barriers, educational barriers, financial barriers, et cetera, and give them the practical experience uh, in order to do so. Essentially, we're kind of a, a, a simple charity. We just raise money. Um, we have a, a badass logo, as far as I'm concerned. We have cool T-shirts and merchandisers, uh, and we do fundraising events. We have amazing partners around the world that's helped us get to where we are and essentially just bring the badge of Doors of the Deep to, to all areas. Because essentially, all the money we get through selling our, our merchandise and all the money we get through um, creating fundraisers can go directly into our initiatives. So... Essentially, what we do, therefore, with that money is to develop initiatives in, in areas that are, are, are finding financial barriers to training and um, create um, employment opportunities. So working with employers uh, in the in different areas to try and create roles um, and also to try and um, balance their, their sort of workforce and also to help evolve social structures to make um, more seeming faring women. So it'll make it a little bit more accessible. So ex examples for me, I used to live and work in Nicaragua. Again, it was very um, strange for a woman to be a boat captain, uh, to work in the diving I was doing. You know, I had uh, a goddaughter out there who was very, very interested in the work I was doing. And, and it was kind of a, a, a crazy notion that she would be able to pursue that as a career in the future. So, again, you know, it was it was more complex than offering opportunities. It was about changing society and changing their views on, on what women could do. Um, and we had amazing um, sort of like uh, work when me and a fellow dive instructor were able to take a group of four local women out, teach them to scuba dive. And the, the sort of like uh, community afterwards was so shocked, but like joyous around it, like, wow, they did that. And then, you know, they were like giving um, sort of shit to the local guys too. And then the guy was like, I don't want to do that. Like, and we created this um, much more, um, com a larger conversation about what they were able to do. And we were, able, we were slowly able to see some of those training into more professional levels and wanting to get here and involved in the ocean more. And, and that's through a simple breakdown of, of, a, of a small social boundary that we could see um, um, happening around me. So what does um, Daughters of the Deep represent? Now, there is a lot of um, kind of, um, what do we call it, um, social awareness around women um, involved in maritime careers. There's some great organizations, Women in Maritime, um, one, of the, one of the ones we liked, uh, we've, we've talked with in the past, doing great work to kind of showcase um, what women are able to do um, within the oceans. Now, the one thing that kind of we've originated started from, at least in the scuba dive world that, that I was in, is that there seemed to be a lot of um, empowerment going, but mostly associated by, you know, what we wear, how we go to the oceans and, you know, showcasing um, essentially just being involved in the activity. Now, I had the question which we kind of posed as a group like, okay, well, what do you do with that awareness? How are you therefore using your empowerment to empower others? And this is where the idea of the charity um, came about because um, 
we wanted to find a solution for that. So rather than just selling merchandise because we can be part of a group that is, that is empowering each other, but what if we sold that merchandise to do more to help women in different situations around the world? Um, and one of the things I brought up recently with someone because they asked us why we we're very dark and ominous. Um, and the idea was that we wanted to represent as much women as possible. Um, even so that now we're kind of becoming less dark anonymous and, and offering different colors of our of our logos and other things like that, because some people didn't want to be the, the, the dark side, shall we say. And so, yeah, we're not anti-pink. We're just anti-only pink. And the idea was that that's all I was seeing, at least in my perspective of, of the movement within more women in, 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 in Scuba was a very pink driven kind of like action. But in my reality, these are some of the, the women I was working with that kind of weren't wearing pink. You know, we come out of dives, hair all scraggly, snot coming out of our noses. It ain't pretty, but, you know, we should celebrate that that grit and grime that comes with these roles. And so that's why we kind of created this more hard hitting imagery. Um, and we wanted to kind of um, sort of like make uh, allow our brand um, to be associated for, for more women, an association for more women. So uh, a little bit about the, the founders then. So obviously that's myself, George. So um, I'm uh, mainly work with a, another nonprofit uh, called Conservation Diver. Um, I work um, around the world setting up marine science programs and helping to develop marine science education, um, mainly for conservation purposes and, and the advancement of research in different areas. Um, I actually knew Elle. She was also uh, one of the originals or members of Conservation Divers. So we kind of uh, were good friends. And um, Elle now is uh, working with WWF uh, as one of the coral scientists out in Australia. Um, Gigi is a, a friend through um, a, a, a contact that we have in Conservation Diver, uh, whose doctorate was in coral restoration. Once I uh, sort of mentioned um, what we were trying to do with conservation, uh, sorry, with Daughters of the Deep, um, Gigi's name came up. I got in touch. Uh, she runs her own dive center out in Mallorca and had um, studied out in, uh, in Australia too at JCU. Um, and again, this was kind of uh, something that very much resonated with her and something she she really wanted to kind of like put her efforts into. Um, and then we have Kate. Kate, I bumped into on a boat when I was like 20 um, and we stayed in touch since um, um, have, don't really see each other anymore because she lives in Australia and I live out in the Azores. Um, but um, she's uh, done crazy cool work with Sea Shepherd over the years, um, done some amazing campaigns. And, and so she was a natural person to kind of contact when we when we started to come up with this idea. And this essentially is the group that that kind of found Daughters of the Deep all during the COVID period where we were kind of locked and not seeing each other, not traveling. Um, and so therefore it kind of created this idea that maybe we could do something from our living room. And, and because of the network that all these individuals have, we were able to start campaigns and fundraise right away. You know, we had the people that that this sort of um, um, action resonated with and we had the contacts to kind of put the money in places we trusted right away. Um, and it's been, you know, a wonder working with these individuals and and this is the kind of um the team that that created daughters of the deep to what it is now and um, we also have uh, and are building a team of of further regional managers so we have regional managers in um uh, the uk the us indonesia thailand uh, madagascar uh, Nui, um and I think that's it right now. Um, and, and yeah a few more that we're going to be bringing on the team as this charity kind of like starts to take off. So I was asked to talk a little bit about conservation diving because that's kind of what my main role is. And it also kind of um, is why Doors of the Deep was established in a way. And Doors of the Deep was originally a campaign that I and my colleague Elle at Doors of the Deep wanted to, to create to kind of encourage more women into marine sciences. Um, and then we realized slowly that it, it kind of was its own entity. And the other guys joined the team and we kind of... Um, transferred it to its own charity to run separately so it does kind of have a key role in in the development and the origins of of doors of the deep now conservation diver is a us non-profit 501c3 um and we essentially originated in 2000 and my god 14 um uh, out in thailand um and essentially what we do is is create a a mechanism for local reef managers and marine scientists 
to create a self-funding um, or closed loop funding model for themselves. So we have a, a created a certification agency um, for those you know familiar with diving. Uh, the simplistic way to kind of describe it is a paddy for the for the marine conservation world. So we have courses, e-learning, we train instructors, um, and we teach these courses, um, and we and we train others to teach these courses so that they can create their own marine science centres. And essentially, um, all of our our, cent our conservation centres are research led. Um, the outputs of all courses create conservation efforts and also research efforts from the data. And the idea is that we're creating this this joined up network of in of individual uh, conservation centres, setting a standard for marine science uh, and and methodologies so that we can have a similar uh, database, a shared. Database database and outputs to kind of help progress conservation and research uh, across the globe much easier and uh, more succinct. Um, not very good image of that, but um, that's an idea of our courses. And um, so, you know, we start off teaching people Well, we originally was a charity based at, based on coral reef research. So a lot of our, our original courses were based around uh, the coral reef ecosystem. So we kind of introduce students to uh, the way to become useful uh, to marine science. You know, a lot of people ask me, can I volunteer? Can I volunteer? And I was like, yeah, cool. But can you dive well? And can you, you know, gather data? And are you comfortable underwater? The reality is, you know, we need to kind of train people to a standard to become useful. So a lot of people come to our centers in order to do that. And, and we offer now a huge range of courses, uh, ranging from um, basic understandings of monitoring techniques underwater uh, to more advanced monitoring techniques of identifying coral taxonomies, coral diseases, um, giant clam survey works. Um, we also do a lot of stuff with restoration, so building artificial reefs, uh, coral restoration work, coral spawning programs, mineral accretion devices, you name it. Some things maybe people don't know what I'm talking about, but Google it. It's fun. It's cool, crazy stuff. Um, and so, yeah, we have a, a large uh, sort of offering of different courses, basically to try and um, find the interest of, of many of the individual. Um, you know, one of the things is always nice is that when people start to kind of look more, they care more. Um, and once they start to realize some of the small uh, details on the reef, you know, originally people want to do our shark monitoring course and sea turtle monitoring course. And by the end, they're doing a course on competition and biofouling and macroalgae dominance and you're like where did why would i ever find that interesting but people do and once they start to learn how crazy cool the ocean is anyway enough of that so uh back to uh doors to the deep then so another uh one of the first things we started to to talk about when doors to the deep was uh, creating a, a a way in which we could hold accessible role models or create accessible role models for for people um now this idea uh kind of came up um, when we originally started, um, we were we had some contacts with some really inspirational um, leaders, uh, female leaders within the um, marine science spaces. Um, one of which I, I had a meeting with on the Azores because um, uh, it, uh, it was Sylvia Earle. She was naming the Azores a hope spot and managed to get a, 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 an audience with her, shall we say, or went to get up to talk to her, uh, talked about this idea. And she was kind of like, yeah, you could put me, but... I won't be able to talk to anyone uh, or I won't be able to really help them. Like, you know, she's super busy. So how is she going to be accessible to anyone who has a question? Um, so she kind of said to me, oh, you need to find people that can answer those questions. And that's where the accessibility uh, came in. So we started to kind of build up this, this, um, this list of individuals that wanted to help others um, through telling their story and offering advice. And that's kind of what the Sisters of the Sea um, was built up to try and do. Um, create this uh, group of accessible role models to help guide the next generation of female maritimers. Um, and so this list we, we is developing, evolving, changing, swapping, um, and we're also trying to work out how to, to better utilize this as, a, as an initiative, um, which hopefully we'll, we'll work on more and, and develop this year. So our initiatives then. So what's the, what are we actually doing? So um, some of the stuff where we've been involved with is funding vocational training. So providing financial solutions to those that need to get set of certifications in order to achieve employment Um working with those employers to try to create apprentices and job roles. So often um, actually funding apprentices, apprenticeships so that uh, the individuals can gain the skills um, mainly with other nonprofits too, because um, again, what we're trying to, to, 
promote is the idea of, of, of greater accessibility, but some of these nonprofits or people working in the maritime space can't offer um, training to, 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 to someone without charging for it, uh, which we understand. So therefore we can work and help other nonprofits to develop um, as well. Um, we have partnered with Paddy um, in many of our locations. They've been um, great support uh, to provide uh, free sort of open water training and um, basic training for, for individuals around um, different locations we work in, just to kind of give them uh, the flavor for, for scuba diving and, 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 and in a non-committal way too, just to enjoy, just to see, and just to kind of be given the opportunity rather than not. And they also are kind of helping us to develop more initiatives for professional training too, um, creating um, scholarship packages for those who want to train through to dive master and, and instructor level. Um, raising awareness uh, through different industries. So this is something that we're slowly building up through uh, something called the Daughter's Diaries, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, accessible role models and sisters of, the, sisters of the sea, which I've talked about. Funding academic studies, specifically in marine sciences. So we've got a number of individuals that we're putting through university at the moment um, to get their, their marine science degrees. And then for us as well, it, it, these these sort of support mechanisms don't just end there. The idea is that, you know, now we're planning the next stages of those individuals to, to find employment for them, support them um, through, through experiences, internships, you name it. So, um, you know, not just funding academic study, but kind of looking to transfer that academic, academic study into a vocational career uh, or career. Uh, helping young marine scientists get practical experience. So that kind of brings in the conservation diver thing again. Luckily, I get to wear two hats wherever I go and I kind of plug one to plug the other, support one, support the other. Um, um, and so like wherever we've got locations with conservation diver teaching, we can offer free um, scientific diving to, to um, the, the, the initiatives that we're trying to, to promote in that area, uh, should they require it. Social outreach and seminars um, to give support where's, where's required and simply allowing, um, in many cases, young girls to continue to go to school and make choices for themselves. Um, one thing that was really naive of us, really, um, is that uh, at the beginning, the idea was, what you know, how do we get more women into these careers? How do we get them diving? How do we get in the ocean? You know, what, what, what's stopping them? You know, where, where, do we, where do we kind of like um, put our efforts? And, you know, in that first instance, um, we started to look in Madagascar where we where we launched and we soon realized actually the issue wasn't necessarily getting them to university it was actually keeping them at school at age nine ten you know and and those sort of things so um a lot of our initiatives then started to evolve in just simply providing them the choice with with also what was important with us with no stipulations you know if they if they decide at 16 the ocean isn't for them cool no worries you know when we're not like crafting the these individuals and putting more pressure on them to to make their choices the idea is this some of the in some of these areas we just need to kind of like give that support and that's where the the, the charities kind of like opened up now to kind of partnering with more uh with with other organizations uh that that do provide family planning that do provide um education on menstrual health these sort of things that kind of are very very important to our mission and almost kind of like come before so that we can kind of do what the work that we do. So again, kind of something that, that we're moving more into is those partnerships to kind of support our overall goals. And do you have time for video? It's a bit long. Maybe I can just skip it or I'll give people a How link. long is it? How long is it? It's long. It's like five minutes, but. Uh, we've got time. Play it, play it, play it. Play, play it. My session next. Oh, good. Oh, how do I play it? Let me see. There we go. All good? Yeah, good. We are Daughters of the Deep, an international charity and community of passionate individuals rising up against the socio-economic barriers that restrict access to marine careers for women. Our mission is to give young women who have a passion for the ocean the confidence and opportunity to try scuba diving, master the sciences, captain ships, and become the lead voices in the fight to save our seas. Every time they hit the water, we want them to feel empowered to achieve what they want out of life. Our mission begins here at our flagship initiative in Madagascar. For the young women of the region, deeply rooted traditions regarding masculinity and femininity present many obstacles and hardships. 
women are framed as inferior and are largely expected to live to fulfill reproductive and household obligations, losing their rights to make decisions about their careers, sexual activity, finances, or children to their husband upon marriage. In many areas, young women are viewed as the family savior and their main responsibility is to find a wealthy older man, usually a foreigner to marry, so that they can provide for the entire family. Such expectations are often imposed from a very early age, driving gender-based violence, the early dropout of girls from school, and underage marriage. 13% are married before the age of 15. Outside of marriage, a woman has little opportunity to provide for herself or fulfill her career goals as she faces glass ceilings, lower pay, and even exclusion from the workforce. From the cousin, Zebiab Tsumatata Tanjumirina, Atona Rulilai, Panakamali. A vozet of Kadevanjanka, Ari Vitaruchima Vitara Vitanaru. Meet Mary Jane. Abandoned by her parents as a baby, she now lives with her grandfather in Nozikomba. And whilst attending school is her dream, she has little financial means to do so. Daughters of the Deep is taking a stand against these issues and has joined forces with the Madagascar Research and Conservation Institute in a bid to provide education security for girls in the local region who would otherwise not have the financial means to attend school. We are honoured to have Mary Jane as our first daughter, who, through our programme, has started college this year. As part of our scholarships, mainstream schooling will be further supplemented by private English lessons, environmental education, and PADI open water certifications. These programs will improve employment options and social mobility for these young women and introduce them to the wonders of the ocean and the need to protect them. We hope to help the next generation of seafaring women to achieve the basic level of education required to reach their own goals in life and to open their eyes to rewarding careers within marine industries. Unfortunately, there are still millions of girls just like Mary Jane in need of our help. By donating to Daughters of the Deep, you can ensure they get the education and vocational training required to pull themselves out of poverty and to realize their ambitions and to open their eyes to the world of ocean conservation. For too long, our daughters have been left deep in the darkness, encased by the pressures of society. It's time to rise up from these abyssal depths, to take to the sea and show the world who we are, daughters of the deep. Cool. Um, so yeah, that was the, one of the first things we ever did, um, a couple of years ago, uh, I had links in Madagascar and an amazing guy, Chris Scarf and his partner Goff were able to produce this, uh, 
wonderful bit of media for us for free um, and kind of help us uh, to kind of showcase better the work that we intended to do. And Madagascar has been a great place for us. And now we have some wonderful partners in that area, Madagascar Whale Sharks and Madamega Fauna, again, that are kind of helping us to kind of create more opportunities in that region too. Um, so yeah, here an example of, a, of some of our latest um, uh, sort of individuals or daughters, as we call them internally. Um, Eros, wanting to kind of achieve her marine science degree, supporting her. Diana, um, a girl who's just come out with her marine biology degree and needed some vocational training. And so we kind of supported her for a period of six months in order to get her a job with Mada Megafauna. Um, and again, we continue to work with individuals on the ground there to kind of support a lot of the work that they're doing as, as nonprofits um, in order to kind of fund and help more women get involved in the work that they're doing. Um, Melanesia, we work with an amazing, amazing organization called the Sea Women of Melanesia, essentially um, helping women become the coastal managers and monitors for their reef systems in and around the country. Um, so this is in Papua New Guinea. Um, the idea was that uh, women can be the leading um, sort of protectors of their, their coral reef ecosystems by introducing the roles um, and making them to be a, a sort of a female led uh, initiative. A wonderful organization. There's great stuff to kind of watch and support with them. And again, another example of a, an organization already doing crazy cool stuff that just through our branding and our sort of like fundraising exercises, we were going to, able to support them uh, directly with initiatives. Thailand, uh, we're working uh, quite a lot with different um, organizations to create uh, internship opportunities for, for Thai citizens and um, to basically allow them to apply their skills. Um, a lot of the time some, when we're doing degrees in, in, in other countries, they don't often get a lot of the practical experience required. You can come out with a marine science degree without necessarily seeing a, a coral or, or diving with them. So a lot of the times it's providing those opportunities in order to kind of um, support them in their, in their ongoing work. New way. This has been a crazy cool partnership. Um, Roxy, who's out there, is just awesome. She's just running uh, with our with our charity with with not much hand holding at all. So the the input they've managed to do um, to uh, to kind of generate this support around uh, the women of the island has been unreal. Like local um, different locals as well buying in, supporting and donating. Uh, it's all around the idea of helping young women get into the oceans more, specifically around whale research and whale observations. And um, there's another amazing organization called um Toma Tomafua. God, I forgot the name. That's awful. Uh run by uh, uh, a lady called Happy. It does amazing um um whale research out there. Um, and she's kind of again offering um uh, support for these individuals uh, for their career paths. So really cool part of the world. Um, I, you know, Pacific Island, for those who don't know. Um, and again, I, I'm, I'm really excited to see how this region grows, uh, especially with the team we have there on the ground supporting it. And then finally, what's new um, for, for this year? So we've got a lot of work to do um, and, and not enough time to find it. Uh, but we are uh, launching, uh, we launched last year in Indonesia. With a great team on the ground there in the Gili Islands, supporting uh, local women in that region uh, achieve their marine science degrees. Uh, we've got swim swim classes again, providing um, the equipment needed um, um, for the religious purposes uh, in that area um, in order to to do swimming. Um, we're also growing our our work in in the Nusa Penidas uh, and the Nusa Islands. We're also launching a whole new initiative with Lumen Ocean, another amazing conservation charity uh, to kind of sponsor women through their training and hopefully um, um, create job opportunities for them within them doing that. We've got a launch in the Galapagos, um, a crazy cool um, uh, charity called Chicas Con Aguilas, which is essentially Girls with Gills. Um, and again, trying to support long-term training uh, of women in Ecuador and, and on the islands um, to, to gain greater access and vocational training. Diaries of the Deep, this is something I talked a little bit about earlier. Um, we are trying to showcase better blogging of experiences different women have had um within their careers within um the, the choices that they've 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 made with their lives um and showcasing those and and sort of like sharing these stories with a greater audience one to just to learn and also to kind of like understand uh, what is actually uh, the issues uh, really are uh, on the world and um as kind of mentioned we've just launched in the UK 
and then we're in the process of launching and um, also the deep as a charity in the usa um so lots going on um, and lots of work to continue to do. Uh, a greater team always needed because, um, as I said, the four of us who started this uh, all have other jobs, other other things to to kind of pay the bills and also some of us, some other charities to kind of run to. So our team's always building, our network is too. Uh, and through sort of like that trusted uh, alliance standing behind an image and a, and a, and a mission, we're hoping to kind of bring doors to deep to, to more areas of the world and, and more um, sort of, uh, I suppose, influence the ocean in, in more ways than than just diving and and, and to yeah, see how this this builds. Um, if you want to support us, please do um, purchase our cool gear where we've got a, an online store. Uh, it's actually a UK store. And T Mill, awesome organization that um, provide, help non nonprofits produce ethically ethical clothing range. Um, they do loads of cool stuff. Um, raise awareness. Um, so again, talk about us. Talk about what we're doing. You can donate directly to if you if you know if you're so inclined and you feel like this whole mission resonates with you. And yeah, be a voice um, in the in the equality message um, in whatever walk of life you do. Um, and if it is with the oceans, you know be a larger voice there too so thank you thank you that was absolutely incredible I could sit and listen to that for so much longer uh, I thought the video was absolutely lovely as well um just the work you're doing is brilliant thank you um so yeah so what what does Daughters of the Deep UK and USA entail what's the changes there then well, the reality is, is we start up these regional offices because of the, uh, you know, the different legalities to actually do stuff and raise funds in in, in different areas of the world. Also, you no know, one one size never fits all um, with with this sort of thing. So again, with the UK, we're doing a complete recce of what's required um, to kind of help um, um, alleviate and 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 sort of equalize, rebalance the the sort of job market within marine sciences within both those regions but the reality is until you're on the ground and really understanding and speaking with more people um you don't truly know where you need to put your money in those in those places uh, and the reality is 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 what the uk market and the, the us market offer is huge awareness building huge brand development so that we can um you know get more people interested and in, in understanding the work that we're doing um the complexities in places like US and U UK are different. Um, you know, there's a lot of social restriction um, as well as financial, but almost not in the same way. Um, and so the, the real need to have someone on the ground there who really understands um, the issues is kind of the most important thing for us. And we have two great people uh, for both those regions. Um, the US, obviously, that's a huge huge space of land um, um, and we will be mainly working with different organizations um, based out in Florida and the Carolinas mainly around reef restoration stuff usually that's kind of my foot in the door because that's what I do um, and so I you know I have trusted partners in, in in those in those industries and you know as well as Elle and, and Gigi and, and Kate we're all in ocean conservation diving ship um, 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 sailing Kate, obviously, a lot more with 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 boat captaining in and lifeguards. That's how I found her. I was just stalking Sea Shepherd because I'd love to go out and be the medic for them. But I'm also yeah. terrified, so I found her just through Facebook and through the really? interest. And it turns out that I actually did your courses. What about? four or five years ago I yeah, got a yeah. conservation diver t-shirt and we've trained under L in Thailand as well. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's amazing how small the world of conservation especially was, but it still is, you know, like and <laughs> which has been really nice the connections really like uh, both of our regional managers in in those two areas have come one of us one of them through friends other connections diving somewhere where they saw the logo or diving with another friend who works at um this this place and you know they've had a conversation and have you seen this so you know we're lucky enough to i mean most of us have been working in conservation for you know um many 10 10 plus years maybe um and so the marine science and the marine conservation world's relatively small that that you can kind of connect dots and and get trusted people in there um yeah. 
uh, when it's we can. Brilliant. It's brilliant. And I'm sure we'll be crossing paths again because this is exactly what I want to uh, pursue my career in. So I was going to ask you lots of questions. But I'm going to have to leave it at that so I can do no my problem. PowerPoint. I will be bothering you um, <laughs> with basically my next steps as well. I'm hopefully yeah. getting the job as the dive medic with Operation Wallacea um, over the summer. But then after that, I need to figure out. I think I'm just going to start collecting all your courses like Pokemon cards because I've got about three or four, but they're yeah, incredible, yeah. aren't they? Nice. Yeah, definitely. Do <laughs> Thank you so much. And oh, uh, the last thing is, I would love, I do this conference annually. Um, mm -hmm. I would love to uh, fundraise for Daughters of the Deep for the next one. Um, oh, so if you could awesome. do a bit of just a 15 minute, what you guys have been up to, is it going to be in about a year? But I would love um, to get some fundraising done for you guys. So let's dedicate the next conference to Daughters of the Deep. Wonderful. Sounds great. Thank you so much, George. Much. Bye. Bye, Take care. Bye, bye. All right, guys, so that leaves me with one presentation about activist mental health. And this is a really, really special one to me. This is one that I've done at Boomtown Festival. And I'm just going to start sharing my screen now. Let's see if you can see it. Perfect. Okay. Let me skip through this one quickly so you guys can all get off. I know we've got um, super busy days. I'll be sticking around to chat to anybody that has any questions. Please do put any questions in the chat box or just feel free to email me and I will just be sending out loads of resources with what people have been up to. Um, if anybody wants to slide, send out their slides, that's absolutely fine. I'm more than happy to, um, but do feel free to contact me um, and I can put you in touch with anybody or just contact them if you've got any questions or want to get involved. So let's go with activist mental health for Buckets of Love Presents Conversations in Conservation Part 2. Thank you for sticking around today. I really appreciate it. So I think I've been doing a lot of uh, interviewing, but I haven't really told you guys much about me. So I'm a GP and emergency doctor. I trained at King's College London, graduated in 2017. I've got a degree in women's health and I'm currently taking my master's in global health policy with the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, I do my bits for the ocean when I can, and that's my passion. So this is me, very, very happy underwater. I feel a little bit uncomfortable on land actually. Uh, I'm much happier in the water. Um, part of the team for Ecomedics and the wonderful plant-based health professionals as well. So definitely check them out. And as I've told you about previously, uh, I am the founder of Buckets of Love Charity, which is an amazing group effort. We fundraise about £18,000 so far for various different charities through having loads of fun. So my mental health experience is extensive and that's why I choose to look after activist mental health to try and reduce rates of burnout in activists that might be looking after the community might be looking after animals, might be looking after the environment. So the, the reason I put this in is to highlight that there are so many different forms of activism. It doesn't necessarily just have to be standing in, in front of a megaphone and, and shouting in the street, although this can be really effective and this might work for you. But it can be in the form of art, in the form of theater, in the form of music, in the form of writing, in the form of film, if we, as we've seen today through Second Nature Films. So there are loads and loads of different ways that we can become effective activists. So if you feel like one way doesn't work for you, then don't despair. You'll be able to find something else that does work for you to allow you to be a proactive activist. I put this slide in, so that's me at the front there in the mask because I try to be anonymous at protests uh, because of my job. Um, I put this slide in because I wanted to emphasize that sometimes people are going to criticize what you're doing and your form of activism might offend some people and your form of activism might elicit a lot of controversy and criticism from people. And that's okay. <laughs> that's the point of activism. The point of activism is to generate emotions and is to, to cause discussion. And if you feel like, you know, somebody doesn't support your activism, then just have a chat with them and explain to them what you're doing. Because often effective conversation can really dismantle the barriers and can stop activism from being such a dirty word with people. And actually then they realize that you're actually just trying to do good things and then they understand and they support your motives. So activism can mean so many different things for various people. So I love word clouds. Um, I think that this just shows that activism is, to me, is a really positive thing. Some people look at activists like a really dirty word, but for me, it just means that you're trying to change a social system and to try and make it more just. 
Um, so for me, activism is a very positive word. And I love this word chart because it means that for a lot of other people, it says growth, movements, sustainable, towards, actions. Um, it's just, it can be seen very positively. So it's about how we frame uh, activism to try and get people on our sides. Why does mental health matter? So one in four people in the UK have been diagnosed with mental health problems. And that's even more people that are walking around undiagnosed because they can't get in touch with their GP or they don't know really how to communicate what they're going through or because their mental health is so bad that actually we've kind of missed that, that input that we can give to prevent. And now it's kind of more curative. So there's lots of different forms of mental health issues and only one third of people are getting the right treatment. So that could be talking therapies, other kind of group therapies, and that can include medication as well. Minority communities are affected significantly, whether that's LGBT, whether that's, um, whether that's Afro-Caribbean communities, whether that's Asian communities, whether that's trans communities, whether that's, you know, uh, children, uh, the elderly. So lots of various um, marginalized communities are disproportionately affected by poor mental health. This can cause so many different issues and it can be such a cycle. So it can cause physical health problems, which can cause social isolation, relationship breakdown. Um, it can lead you to become increasingly isolated from society. And, and it means that you're, you might not be as able to care for yourself or for the causes that you care about. So I love this slide. It's a great infograph. I always put this in my, on my talks about mental health because burnout is a syndrome of not being supported adequately by the resources and by systems around you. So often workplaces will say to you, oh, and you need to be more resilient. You know, you need to do all of these things to combat burnout. But actually what we need is better support for activists, better communication, better therapy networks, um, better gyms, better, better financial services available. So actually, if you feel like you're burning out or you feel like, oh, I've been made to feel like I'm not resilient enough by my workforce or by you know, my community, then this is not a problem with you. This is a structural and systematic imbalance that needs to be addressed. So me activist mental health matters because activists are the people that care for people we care for animals and we care for the planet and I really feel like there's not enough people doing this obviously we've got so many incredible people that are doing it as we've heard from today and as we see from our social networks all the time but I just feel like not enough people are caring about these things and that's why it's really important for us to be effective activists so that we can communicate with people why these things are important Activist burnout can lead to a lot of different symptoms. I'm not going to go through an extensive list, uh, but I just wanted to put this in because there's such a big interlink between the brain and the body. So you might start experiencing burnout or poor mental health as physical symptoms. That could be things like headaches. That could be things like back pain, neck pain. That could be things like insomnia, or you could start experiencing it as mental symptoms such as pessimism, low energy, poor sleep, and um, feeling really feeling really hopeless about the future. These are some of the main symptoms of burnout. And these can be uh, really, really in association with things like anxiety and depression as well. So please do speak to your GP or a mental health professional to try and get a proper diagnosis. It's important to rule other things out first, like vitamin deficiencies or like an illness. Um, but then if you have a diagnosis of this, once other things have been ruled out, then there are really good support networks available for activists to prevent burnout. How can we do that? So I love this because it divides this into loads of different amazing pillars, physical, emotional, social, spiritual, personal, space, financial, and work. So I put this in because self-care can be different for everybody. So what one person really enjoys, another person might absolutely hate. Like I can't imagine sitting in front of a TV and binging on Netflix, but I can imagine getting in a really, really hot shower or a really, really cold uh, sea or, or an ice bath or something like that. So some people might absolutely hate that, but I find that really, really therapeutic. Um, so self-care is different for everybody. So you find what works for you and stick to it. It's really important to make routine and to even make five minutes a day to make time for this self-care because it's a really, really good way of preventing burnout. 
I thought this was really funny. Jan McCarroll's uh, comics are really funny. I think they're quite tongue in cheek and they're quite sassy. So this is great because this is the warrior pose. So we all know the benefits of yoga. As I said before, my lovely friend Molly Elston does regular yoga sessions for Buckets of Love. Um, but often it can be really difficult to clear our mind when we're supposed to be focusing on like meditating or yoga or on, you know, ice baths. It can be really difficult. So it's about just accepting those thoughts and recognizing it and then moving on and just being really present to try and, you know, be mindful of what we're going through. I thought that was quite funny. So there's not just self-care. It's really important to care. So that can be in the form of really various things that can be just calling somebody, sending them a message, sending them a funny picture, sending them a picture of your cat, acts of kindness. So that could be giving your time, giving your talent, cooking for people, actually giving therapies and medicate med meditations, medications. Um, if you know that you're good at something like I can do acupuncture, then I offer that to people at my wellness days. Got a really good friend. She does uh, massage sessions as well. And then we've got loads of people that are offering, for example, my good friend, Vanessa Sturman. She's absolutely amazing offering food advice to people that might be struggling with that. So she provides care in that way. So it's really important that we work with each other to create supportive environments and that we work together as a community like Buckets of Love is doing and like all of these amazing projects are doing to try and improve the mental health of the people that join as well. I love this book and I stole it from one of my best friends, Anna. So I actually have bought you another book. Um, but I might give it away because it's such a good book. So this is written by the Surgeon General of the United States, and he didn't choose to write about medicine. He didn't choose to write about surgery. He didn't choose to write about healthcare. He chose to write a book about the healing power of human connection in a sometimes lonely world. So this is Vivek Murthy, and he chooses to write about the benefits of community and about the risks of being socially isolated. So it's really, really important that we work together as a community to try and improve our mental health as activists. So just get involved with different events. Go to the events that you might be a little bit, you know, on the fence about. Go to the conferences and the workshops and just network because it can be so very supported and supportive if you feel isolated. So again, Buckets of Love, amazing, easy way to get involved in community. Look out for our events coming up later in the year. We'll have our fifth annual drum and bass rave. We're going to have a few more cinema screenings. Um, and I'm already getting the ball rolling for next year's Conversations in Conservation, for which we'll be fundraising for Daughters of the Deep. So really exciting. And activism isn't just something that you need to do to go to a protest. This is something that you could do absolutely every day. So you can go to charity shops, you can buy second hand, you can really think about where you're spending your money, whether that's going to kind of local markets or more sustainable vendors. And then going where you spend your money is the most important thing that we can do. This is a political statement. So really think about it, really think about supporting sustainable, local, vegan businesses and not buying new things if you don't need to. Um, wear your favorite slogans. So I always feel really empowered if I go to a non-vegan event and wearing my vegan t-shirt, um, especially if it's somewhere like a rave or something like that, where nobody's, you're not really going to talk to many people. So everybody can see um, what you're wearing and everybody can see that you're a healthy and happy activist. So I love that. Go to talks and workshops, support people, support your friends, support people doing amazing projects and learn from them as well, because it could inspire you on your activism journey. Call that questionable behavior. Now that can be really difficult, um, but often I just like to do this online. You know, if I'm scrolling through Facebook or something like that, I really won't be scared to just write a comment on an article um, that debunks what they're saying, but it can also be in person. So if you see something that you think is wrong, make sure that you're supported by people so that you feel safe, but always, you know, you can do it in a gentle way. It doesn't have to be aggressive, but always stand up for people if you think, or stand up for the animals of the environment if you think that behavior is wrong. I love sticking stickers on everything. Everybody will have seen me. I've got told off a couple of times recently. I don't mind. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Sorry, I stuck a vegan sticker on a birthday cake. Um, but no, I put these all up around the tubes, on buses. Uh, I put stickers absolutely everywhere. And I think it's so simple. They're really easy to get off as well. So it's not really vandalism. Um, people can take them off easily. But I think it's just a really nice way of um, putting your motto and your logos and your beliefs out there.
and create. Like I said, it could be in the form of theater, poetry, music. I love to write and I love to write poems as well. And for me, that's such a brilliant form of activism um, where I might not be so good at other things. So yeah, activism can come in any form. So just do what you feel is right and the things that make you really motivated and inspired. So these are uh, people that I choose to look after. So these are the vegan activists. I look after groups like Animal Rising, Anonymous of the Voiceless. And I'm really, really proud to be involved with them. And yeah, just find your crew and go out with them, kind of make your community. It's such a beautiful thing to be part of. Uh, but yeah, thank you to all of these people that kind of go out and put in the cold over winter and use your voice for the voiceless. So a couple of quotes now. Uh, activism is my rent for living on the planet. I found the cure for depression is action, which I love. And I'm no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I'm changing the things that I cannot accept. So I had to edit this this morning. Oh dear. Okay. So I'm just gonna move on to this because um, my granddad died this morning and I'm just gonna dedicate this conference. I think he could have just told me if he didn't wanna come, you know? I don't think it's that boring. <laughs> but last year he watched the whole thing and he was really, really proud of me. So I'm just gonna show you a video now, uh, which was a video from our birthdays. <laughs> We're watching the UN approach, the WHO approach to an unwell patient. And for further detail, please refer to the basic emergency care manual. And he was so interested. We recognize early to save the lives of patients. The ABCD approach <laughs> is used to approach every patient in a systematic way to identify life threatening conditions. Early. Yeah, he was 91. He was 91 years old. And I'm just going to read a little tribute that I wrote to him this morning when I found out. A tribute to my granddad. In loving memory of Sirish Chandra Rao, the only person that I have ever known to have lived a whole lifetime with type 1 diabetes while being a doctor in jungles and armies and across the world. A person who sounded pretty terrifying in his youth, who found his chill in the sun in Spain, drinking beer on his lunchtime walks until the age of 91 years old. A man who bought me the sparkliest of dresses from the charity shop, all for a euro, a man after my own heart. And I'm actually wearing one of them today. I said to him, Grandad, I can't wear that. It's got a big hole in the front. It's outrageous. And he said, no, just buy it. And I wear it all the time. I wore it on my birthday and I'm wearing it today. A man who responded to everything with God is great. I am happy as he had found genuine happiness. He had saved lives on planes. He had rescued people who had fallen off mountains countless times. He dealt with many a snake bite. He lived across Belize and Germany and Hong Kong. And finally, he'd settled down into the tropical, scenic and luxurious ends of Woolwich. <laughs> I never realized that he was a GP with a special interest in tropical and jungle medicine until well after I had decided to go down the same route. I dedicate this conference and a lifetime of learning and managing patients to the best of my ability in crazy places to him. I will go and see my grandma this weekend and we will celebrate a wonderful life. Okay, so thank you guys. Um, I'm probably gonna leave any questions for a couple of minutes. Um, I'm more than happy to be contacted on any platform really. You can contact me on LinkedIn. Um, you copy my link tree, it's Dr. Ishani Rao. I've got loads of my articles on there. I've got Buckets of Love's first conversations in conservation conference. Um, on there as well and that's well worth a watch uh, that was absolutely brilliant and we fundraised uh, some equipment for the Sussex Seabed Restoration Project and Steve showed us what he bought with that today so we're contributing to the reforestation of the kelp forests in Sussex with our last year's conference so yeah please feel free to reach out if you think I can help with anything it's dr.ishani.rao on Instagram um, I'm always happy to be contacted and to help out. And if I can't help out, I will find somebody that can. 
So um, thank you so much, guys. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed the conference. And um, yeah, if anybody has any questions, then I will be sticking around for a couple of minutes. And um, if not, I'm going to go make my lovely vegan lunch. So thank you all so much for, for joining. Of course, I will send out slides. Um, if you, I think I got your email this morning, didn't I? So I will just send you out everything that I've got and some resources of bits and bobs that I've written. And also last year's conference, that one was a bit longer. I was exhausted after that one. Um, that was about five, five and a half hours long, but that's all on YouTube. So I'll send you that as well. But thank you all so much. Um, buckets of love. Oh yes, definitely. An app together for vegan businesses. Sounds like loads of us will want to get involved with that. Um, thank you guys. Bye. Take care. Have a great day. Look, 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 buckets of love.